Hey, here we are at the Lone Star Sports Show on the Lone Star Sports Network. Giving it to you like it is. All things sports, all things Texas. Today's show is brought to you by FastMallSports.com. Fast Small Sports located in Chicago, Illinois. Right there on Michigan Avenue in the Windy City where our co my co-host is from. His, his city. What all do y'all call Chicago up there? Mm. Uh, um, Chi-town, Chi-town, Chicago, Chi-town, Windy City. Uh, Windy City, Chirac. Chirac. Anymore, heard, it's kind of embarrassing. Hadn't heard the Chirac move yet. <laughs> yeah, all the shootings, it should be called Chirac. <laughs> okay, that Actually, was, that was a Spike Lee movie. I don't know if you ever saw it. Yeah, I, really have, I, I recommend people watch it. It's a little bit out there because he stretches a few things, but it's uh, it opens your eyes about what's going on and kind, and of, kind of embarrasses me in a way. I'm sort yeah. of embarrassed for what I turned into. So Yeah, but you right here where there were – Fast Small Sports is located right there in the heart of Chicago. Thankful for Ross Comerford, CEO and founder, to continue to bless this process and the growth of Lone Star Sports Network and the things that we're doing. Guys, like I said, we've got a special guest from the Pac-12 coming in uh, right at around about 6.30 or so. But we're going to chime in because it is football season, football time. So we're talking some football. Like I said, today's show is brought to you by FastSmallSports.com. You can get us right here on Periscope, but if you want to get the real full-blown solid piece on everything, then you need to lock in at YouTube Live, the Lone Star Sports Network. You can see all 30-some shows that have aired. You can type in some of your search words and things that you want to know if you want to know about what's going on in in high school and basketball and recruiting, if you want to know what's going on in college football, if you want to know what's going on in Texas as it has to relate to sports and the angle and perspective that we have on things, and all the great things that go on here in Texas, on and off the field, in and between the lines. In, in between the lines and outside the lines. Lone Star Sports Show. Texas football, a lot of a lot of things going on. When you say Texas football, you're talking about UT, or you're talking about TCU, you're talking about the Dallas Cowboys, you're talking about the Houston Texans, you're talking about Baylor. How about a good shout-out to the UNT how about uh, it, man? Screaming Eagles. Is that what they are? The Screaming Eagles, the Mean Green. That's two the big The guys wins. up in Denton, Texas. That's two big wins, right? Because two big beat, wins. they beat SMU big. And who was it they just beat? They beat the Arkansas. Yeah. They just beat Arkansas. Uh, love, love the theatric. He should have won a Grammy for that. That uh, piece right there of what they were able to do. You know, in a, in a situation like that, did you see the play? No, but I was reading. Uh, the reason I happened to notice it was I was doing some research today. I read Pat Forte's yeah, article. Yeah. He was talking about the seven guys in the hot spot, yeah. and he's well, talking coach, about you, Chad Horsby, it, coach, being it, one it, of them. You didn't see the play? The, no. the, the play. Oh, yeah, yeah, the fake play? Yeah. The, yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah right. If you're not going to yeah. cover up my guy who's wide, that's, you should, that'd be an automatic checkoff. Yeah. No, you, if you don't cover yeah. him up, we're going there every single time. Yeah. No, that, that, oh, yeah, that's that a was tremendous. Deal. Yeah, it was tremendous. Just taking advantage. They said they had been working on that for a pretty good while now, and it was icing on the cake. They actually had and handled the game quite well without that, but that was the icing on the cake. I bet they never get away with that again this year, but that's, but that's Coach, a good thing because that sets something need, else up. It goes back to what, I, what you and I have been arguing about for the second half of the day today. What does a win mean? A win, everything. Everything in the world. It, 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 it means more than a loss. <laughs> you know, we start talking about, we start trying to analyze, did that win have very much value or did it not have very much value? It, it all comes down to W's and A's, coach. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, there's one of the one of the you know perversities of college sports is some guys have to take a few L's early on in the first three games because they're playing those money games, and you know you well, can't I mean, hold those guys that, to task. Well, right? well, that's a different. But once you get to Power Five, yeah, it's wins. That, like Kevin that, Sumlin, that, nobody cares about Kevin's excuse. I'm talking about the guys that get fired right away for winning, for losing. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like Tom Herman, University of Texas. You can sit here and say, oh well, USC is this and they're that mm-hmm. or whatever. If he was in a situation right now, maybe screaming at one and two going into that conference, and he still might get mauled. Let's not yeah. let's not act like USC is a big, strong, physical team because they're not. When, when, when you when you when you look at, at what's going on in 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 in, in their schedule and wh- and where they would be, you know, in the event that they would not have won, and the situation that they would be in right now, it's not pretty, coach. Well, it's not pretty with the win. I mean, it, but at least it, it, it takes the people who are actively trying to burn your ass and it gets them away from you for a little while. It buys you, it thickens and, the and ice that, up a little. I was talking but, about the but, thickness but, of the ice under your feet, you know? And, and, and no doubt about that. But but the thing is, uh, Coach, and I think you're kind of living in Coach La La Land, <laughs> you know, yeah, you, 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 you never escape. You cannot escape the, 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 the reality of – the expectation to win. You never fix it. I'll give you a perfect example. I don't know if it was Tubby Smith at at, at uh, right after they had won a, a national championship at, at Kentucky. Uh-huh. 
it was either Tubby Smith or it may have been Rick Pitino. But one of the two of them had won a national championship that year, okay. and they were having an athletic banquet. And you got to realize fans and boosters are never satisfied. No, no, no. They, the only, only thing you can feed them is another W. Right. They probably, they're probably they probably pissed you didn't cover the point spread in the well, national championship game or something, and, and, right? And, and it comes down to that. And what was said to, to, the, to the said coach by a couple of the boosters, he said, well, coach, we had a pretty good year. He won a national championship. But uh, they lost two games at home that year. He said, well, we don't lose in Rump Arena. So here he is coming off a national championship, celebrating it at an athletic banquet, and – the best thing that they can come up to say to come up with to say to him is, is that we don't lose at home. Well, but it's not fair for you to say I live in Coach La La Land. I just I don't have to like the fact that people screw with you all the time. I mean, do they screw with you all the time? Yeah, you bought into it, and I don't go home and whine about it. That's why I stay off social media. Well, because if you give me three beers and I go home and listen to some unqualified quack talking shit about me, I'm probably going to talk it back because that's my natural reaction. But that's a stupid thing professionally, so yeah. I probably kept a job by staying off social media. Okay, here you go. Let's let's take a look at. It. If, 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 if they're sitting there, they lost to Maryland, so they already ticked. No way they thought they should have lost to Maryland. No, not two years in a row now. Yeah, Remember two that. years in a row, home at their place at and home. at home. Right, yeah, right. So they got it both ways. Any way you want to look at it, they took it both ways. Okay, you go beat Tulsa by seven. And uh, Tulsa, hold on just a second. Tulsa dropped two touchdown passes and missed three field goals. Yeah, okay. And that's a bad team that you right. should have lost to. That you could have lost to. Oh, very easily. Could have lost to, should have lost to, but you didn't convincingly handle your business the way that you thought you should They'd have burnt 39 of his 40 damn acres if he'd mm -hmm. lost that game. Yeah, it, it is, exactly. So you sit there. So you come back. You got USC. Big brand name. Not the USC that we know to, to be and, and how we have seen them in the past, but they're still USC. You right. won that game. Right. Okay, now you got TCU coming in this weekend. And TCU's going to blow their doors off because these, TCU had Ohio State beat. You know, Gary Patterson's pissed off. Yeah. Um, I know we're talking. I'm not trying to hammer Sam Ellinger. I'm not a huge fan of his. I think he's average, a little above average, but I don't think he's great. And but, if you're not going to be, if you're not going to have a great quarterback, you better have a hammer running game. And I'm not sure if they have that yet. You, 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 only time will tell. You, see, and that goes back to, and I don't want to get off this Longhorn situation that right. we're on here, but you got in order to be dynamic you gotta have a a dynamic piece it's a dynamic defense a dynamic running back like you alluded to stretch it's a stretch a vertical guy uh, receiver. there's got to be somebody that's pretty much un, unguardable like we say in basketball mm. right you got to have one piece that's unguardable that makes all the other regular normal pieces work so you can't sit here at like and be in the university of texas and, and you say okay how good is the quarterback we serviceable but you can't be serviceable with us. Everything can't be serviceable, and you're going to get great out but, of it. See, that's my, that's my point. I don't want to sound like I'm crushing the kid because I don't have anything personal against him. But, I mean, all right, let's, let's be honest. We talk, about, uh, we talk about confirmation bias. Okay, mm -hmm. Todd Dodge, legend, as a player at Texas. Todd Dodge, legendary high school uh, football coach. Todd Dodge coached the kid. So maybe maybe we overrank the kid a little bit because we listen. I mean, at the end of the day, Todd Dodge is a great guy. But just because Todd Dodge says he's a great kid doesn't make they're, him they're, anything. They're, but a, and I'm, if he's I'm, a great I'm, kid, I'm, that's I'm, good. I'm going to give Snoop Johnson some some credit here. Snoop Johnson always says if you're going to have a championship team or if you want to recognize a quality team, everybody starts out with five and five or eleven and eleven. Right. There has to be one guy that on there that creates a situation that deserves some more attention. You were a basketball coach. John Robertson, right here. Yeah. Perfect example. That's the ring you. Show him the no, ring, coach. No, no. no. I have that, that ring because of that, one that, player who moved here from Florida. Yeah. His mom moved here. She got riffed on a job from AT&T, so it was a legit transfer and everything. And oh, this yeah, kid yeah, walks in. I'm going to get that legit because I didn't cheat. I'm going to make sure everyone hears that. So anyway. You're outside the statute of limitations. Don't worry about all that, coach. But it was just great. That's that, that that what do y'all call it, Texas Association of Basketball T, 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 T A B C T A B C group. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, statute of limitations. All right, all right. I bought his mother. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but a bad joke. But anyway, if he doesn't show up, we don't win. No. Uh, we were a very good team. I, I still had but, three other Division One players, but the, we but, didn't but, have uh, that dynamic point guard that drew doubles, and we didn't have that guy that you had to you had to guard. John it's John. just like I've been to two Duncanville practices now. Duncanville is creating an atmosphere, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say this in advance. I'm gonna forecast this. Okay. They're creating an atmosphere that's gonna require help. And when you require help, now you take this Division II NAIA, hope he gets a scholarship kid that can make two jump shots in a row, and now he's making threes on you. Right. Now he's getting backdoor layups on you. Well, you, you, you made a, used a phrase that I learned kind of late in my career. It's not like I'm not intellectually curious about basketball, but some things you just learn when you learn them. Mm -hmm. You learn them when you get that player, right? Right. And what I didn't realize until I had a John, 
what I started doing more research was the number one element to, to good offense is you've got to force help. If you if, if you I got, can't beat you, you I can't all force it. Right, exactly. Right. So it, forcing help, we were playing five on four at some point in time. And then, well, and then if me, you got kids who make good decisions, you're, it's let, on. Let, let me let you in on the secret. The same thing happens in football. Right, right, exactly. You, you have know. to have a guy that they have to super account for. Yeah. Like, yeah. all right, here's a good example. Josh Gordon is going out to New England. Now, I know everyone calls me a homer because Rex plays for him, but, but leave that alone. You got Gronk, who is absolutely unguardable and requires a double team. Mm-hmm. Now you got Josh Gordon, who's going to be opposite him all day long, running stretch streaks. It's one of the things up, when, when we, talk, we talk about some of the Dallas Cowboys stuff, I'm going right. to come back and, and visit back on the same thing, which gives me the ability to, 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 uh, Forecast some of the things I'm gonna forecast on the Cowboy situation. But if you stretch with Gordon and you run Edelman across the middle, you run bubbles out of the back. That's everything available. But that, it all predicated off two things. The first thing is, draw, is Gronkowski draws a double, and, and Gordon has to be guarded with a really good corner. Yeah, and that, that's the, that's the whole thing that it comes back down to as we get ready to draw to the end of a deal is that's one of the things that they're struggling with. So you know we're happy for the Longhorns to go and get that because you go to TCU, you know, and then you got to head up to Manhattan. Who, which anything can happen. I don't know quite how good they are. And then guess what? You got the Red River shootout. So, and, the, and you follow that with Baylor, Oklahoma State, West Virginia. And Baylor's struggling right now. You're Oklahoma State. But you can be in some situations here. So every win counts. Basketball, football, whatever. Let's win and let's go Let's go do some film study and try to figure out how we can get better. Hey, a really quick shout out. Kenny Perry has a two-game winning streak up at Kansas with David Beatty, and I'm really happy for Kenny. He's one of the greatest guys I know. Kansas is they're, – they're, they've struggled over the years, but they're playing real well right yeah, now. Well, uh, they're going to hit the meat grinder right. here. They're coming into, into conference season. But, but anyway, but shout out to Kenny. Congratulations. It's a win. It's yeah. a win. And that's the thing you got to understand about the business. That's the thing about sports is – Winning cures all. Winning gives you hope. Practice is a whole lot better. It buys you time, keeps people off your back. Everything's it, better. It, it, everything is better when better. everything is better when you're winning. Like I say, in the here at six thirty, we're gonna have another host that can tell us a lot about winning, having all the experience and, and success that he's had in the winning process. You know, and winning even helps with recruiting. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you know, all the way across the board. But you got the Lone Star Sports Show right here on the Lone Star Sports Network, giving it to you like it is. All things sports, all things Texas. As we said earlier, today's show is brought to you by FastMallSports.com. But this particular segment is brought to you by Hardham Hotels. HardhamHotel.com. Go take a look and listen and see how you can put your money where you sleep. Back in 180 seconds with more of the Lone Star Sports Show. When did Bryce Cook commit to SMU? Hardham Hotels. Make money where you and millions of others spend money. Hardham Hotels Investment and Development Group's primary disciplines include hotel acquisitions, hotel development, hotel project management, as well as asset and partnership management. At Hardham Hotels, we invest in upscale, focused service, and extended stay hotel properties, mainly in Texas and other major urban markets. We are hotel owners, developers, investors, and asset managers persistent in our pursuit of successful ventures and passionate about our products. We provide nationally branded investment opportunities, including Hilton, Marriott, and Hyatt Hotel franchises. Hardham Hotel strategically places the right product in the right location for the right customer. Get started with us today. Visit us online at www.hardhamhotels.com. Hardham Hotels, put your money where you sleep.
Hey, here we are back here for the second segment of the Lone Star Sports Show right here on the Lone Star Sports Network in the heart of Texas, right here in Oak Cliff, Texas, giving it to you like it is and where it should be. Today's show is brought to you by Fast Model Sports, but this particular segment is brought to you by the product of Fast Model Sports, which is Fast Recruit. Go take a look at Fast Model Sports. I don't care if you're a high school coach, summer coach, college coach, NBA coach, WNBA, any level, any level of basketball Fast Mall Sports has a product that can make your process work a little better and a little smoother. Catch up with the new age and times and where we're going to analytics and see how technology is leading basketball into the 21st century. Right now, we're talking football. It's Texas in the middle of football. It's September. Doesn't feel like September outside. We're almost 100 degrees outside. It's really hot today. You just turn the air conditioner down and just hang on. (laughs) It's coming. But I saw the signs going up that the state fair is about to get started. So once we know the state fair is coming, Oh, it's time, yeah, yeah. Cool. So I'm starting to set up a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's going to cool off a little bit. But I, I hate, I hate those guys going out there at that two o'clock. I was over at uh, what's my man's name? The head coach over at Duncanville High School, football coach. Uh, Reggie Samples. Yeah, I was with Coach Samples. Well, they was, they was sweating it out there. Coach. Oh yeah, I bet. I'm glad I'm a basketball. Man, scout. when you start, I always, I always tell people. The, <laughs> yeah, the thing I love about basketball, it's always 72 degrees and sunny. Yeah. And if it's sweaty, you got a towel. If it's cold, you put on a jacket. But I'll it take, it take, it take 68 and sunny. Yeah, well, you just put all day long on that sunny part, right? Yeah. Hey, you know, it's really funny. I just thought about something that you made me think of where I heard a funny line when, when you're talking about the Rick Patino. You know, you guys had a pretty good season, but you lost twice at home thing. Mm-hmm. Where I, somebody told me one time, this is victory has a thousand fathers, but defeats an orphan. Yes, sir. You got to share it when you can, win, but when you lose, that shit's on you. All you, on you, you go you, live with it you, yourself. You cannot say it. It is a lonely, lonely place. Oh, I've in, been there. In I've been there. No, it's just a whole different atmosphere when you lose. Well, it's you feel like you have to make excuses for yourself, but you have to show gotta, you, you well, have to show confidence in the in the, in the face of it, nothing that you have but, to base it on. You got to say show confidence in the face of defeat, but you but you but it's the explanation. See, yeah. people can can deal with a little losing if they feel like something's on the horizon or we can come up with a legitimate explanation. Right, but, but first you have to explain, and second of all, that'll never appease everybody, so you're never going to appease everybody. So then what you're going to get is the counter-narrative. So no matter what you do, and what you're really thinking inside is, why the F am I explaining myself to you? Mm-hmm. You know, I always laugh about people, and I say, so, you know, have you ever been a 6A head basketball coach? And they say, no, you know, but I did say a holiday in select last night. Come on, yeah. man. But I thought it was a basketball. That's, doesn't that's make me a basketball coach. But that's the same. But, but you, you can't fault that. If that was not the case, then being a six A basketball coach wouldn't mean. What oh it sure, meant. sure. No, I go go. Yeah, with, you know, with the heavy as the head that wears the crown. I got you on that one. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not whining about it. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, and, and that's where you have to grind your teeth. And that's why you know, since I've retired, it's kind of liberating because for 29 years of grinding your teeth and dealing with it, now I can just grind my teeth and not deal with it. It doesn't mean I'm going to go off. It doesn't mean that I detest those people, but it's annoying because I would never think to go into a lawyer's office and tell him how to drop a legal brief. I would never think to tell a dentist how to draw my teeth, but he's going to come out and tell me how to break a press. Just shut up, dude. But that's, can't say that's, that, of course. that's what makes sports great. Oh, yeah, yeah, because there's enough interest. That's why, yeah. you, well, you know, I always that's tell people, I said, great. you can get pissy about football being overvalued and basketball being overvalued, but they don't sell tickets to, to English competitions. And I don't mean that disrespectfully to English no, teachers, all due but respect they don't to- sell tickets yeah i mean with all due respect is all a part of it and i think the integration and understanding and the power of sports is is, is where we drop the ball a lot of times because we don't totally indulge ourselves in the grand picture the grand uh, scheme of things and we underrate what we really have to bring and what we do what we what's going on Mm. yeah hey did you happen to catch that article today where they were talking about california colleges saying that they won't honor a, uh, a show cause order, and so therefore, because they don't think a show cause order is constitutional, they may have to bail them out, every California school out of the NCAA. That was a little bit random of thought, but it just kind of blew me away. <laughs> no, I didn't get that one. Yeah. That's pretty good, though. No, it's wild, but they're, they're literally saying, we don't think you should be able to enforce a, a show cause order, which for those of people out there who don't understand, when a coach gets in trouble in order for, to – when you want, want to blackball them, you don't blackball them. What you do is you give them a show cause order because if you blackball them, they'll sue you and win. If you give them a show cause order, it says your next school has to show cause why that person should be that and they person take, they and hired. They, and they take a, 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 a lot of uh, uh, potential responsibility. In other words, right. anything. If he does like it again, it's on you, bro. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. And, and it's really, really difficult because there's really not that many people out there. I know Alan knows some really high-end coaches, but there's very few people that with a show cause order, the head coach is willing to fade the heat on it because when you go in front of the committee on infractions and you go in front of all these different people, they don't like. They already don't like the fact you make that well, much money. Now, they're, now you're hiding a shady. I think I just lost something here. Yeah, I lost my sound. Yeah, um, you're hiring a shady person. I think we just hit something with our feet. Yep, that was me. I, c- I accuse you of it all the time. Plug yourself back in there. Right. I try to move it all the way over here on my side. 
and, and deal with everything. And, and I did I did the Tom then. I did the Allen Branch. Oh, no, the, the, humility is, the humility is underwhelming. Oh, yeah. I don't, I, don't, I don't have a problem with owning up to my mistakes. I did that. See, I didn't unplug mine. No. Yeah, I noticed <laughs> my foot, that. My foot no difference. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to get the white guy. I knew this was a racial thing. <laughs> but how about them Cowboys? Mm. Hey, one and one. Mm. I, I, just if you're just going to be analytical and just not – let's not say the Cowboys. Just look at the game and say, what did you think? I would say the offense was – Average. I was, you know, you had one big broken play that was the function of a couple of missed tackles. So I'm not taking it away, but let's not act like this is a guy who's going to run Jalen Ramsey crazy or something. You know, this isn't a, a guy who's going to do that consistently. So I don't really know. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what to say. I mean, a buddy of mine made a good point. He said trying to evaluate the the, the value of the the Texas win and the Cowboys win were both wins, and they were both against name brand teams. But I don't really know the value of either, evaluate either one because you don't really know how good either one of those is. I thought I'm Eli Manning's you, terrible. I think that, Eli that, Manning's that, terrible these that, days. That, that's a that's a great. Well, he is what he is, coach. Right. But but let's let's go back to what we're looking at. We we we're looking at the Texas team, right, right, University sure. of Texas and Dallas Cowboys. The one difference is in 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 the University of Texas win and the Dallas Cowboy win. Dallas Cowboy, Cowboys have some dynamic personnel. Right. They have a defense that's, we're going to say, good. Yeah. Not necessarily great. And not to, what did y'all have in 1985 when y'all had the crazy defense? Yeah, they're not that. They're not the 85 Bears. They're not the 85 Bears or anything. But they can not, create pressure on the edge. Randy yeah. Gregory creates right. some problems. But, but, and, 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 and they're going to get better because they got two or three guys that are, that are, that are, that are coming back into the process and they're going to get deeper on defense. So they, they're really not – Forecasted to get any worse on defense, so they're right. they're stable, they're better than serviceable on defense. Yes or no? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and the other thing too is, regardless of level, I was going to talk about it in regards to Texas, but if we'll stay in the Cowboys, is everything gets scouted out over time. Once well, you I mean, get six or seven games into the season, people know what you can and what you can't do, and they're going to try to force you to do what you can't do and not allow you to do what you and want that's, to do. That, that's funny. You kind of play right into into my angle on all of this. Score a point. Yeah. The 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 the, the beauty of it. Of, of where the Cowboys are right now, you're not really sure what it is they do well. Right. So they're not. Yeah. They're not. They're still yet See, to be scouted. To be determined. To yeah. be determined. Right. And, and that's a kind of a good place to win. It's kind of like you, Coach. Okay. We're gonna use you. That's what's the great thing about having you on the show. You got the experience to bring this to the table. If you were able to win, let's say in basketball. Eight games okay. in the beginning of the season. Let's say you're eight and one, and you're eight and two. Okay, and you've gone and won a tournament to play for a championship in a good tournament. And at that point, you feel like none of your best players have played their best, and you haven't installed three quarters of your offense. How do you feel going forward then? Probably pretty confident, you know, yeah. because you're already playing well, and you haven't put a lot of things in. You got you like to think you're going to get better at what you already have in, and then by adding extra things, you're, you make yourself harder to guard. Like me and Barron at, at Grand Prairie, I'm not acting like we're the only people who do this, but we would incrementally add things. Yeah. Like I would never change inbounds plays. We ran three inbounds plays, or maybe two. I run the same press breaker. But we would always add twists on offensive, like the second time around district, because you play everyone. Tw- For people who don't know, you play your seven district opponents twice. Yeah, most, so most like, districts. Most right. conference, right. Yeah. So anyway, what ends up happening then is you always want to be able to throw a curveball at someone the second time around. You don't yeah, want to show all you your don't cards. In my favorite saying, you don't want people to get comfortable with what you, your success. Don't right. show all your cards, right? Yeah. Keep something back. Right, and you're always doing it. So that's what I like about where the Cowboys are right now. See, I feel like the Longhorns are sitting over here, and they're still scrambling for some leadership and identity towards some type of dynamic nature about them. That's the difference in NFL and, 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 and NCAA football. Uh, the 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 Cowboys are sitting here. We know that 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 uh, Dak Prescott is a capable NFL quarterback. Right. We, we say that's good enough. I but mean, your dynamic is Zeke, and Zeke is what sets the whole tone with everything. Right. You know that. And, and you still and you still sitting here. And when you look at Zeke, Zeke has run the ball seventeen times and fifteen times. When he was good, he averaged 26, 27, 28 carries a game. So you haven't totally put him into it. The wear and tear is not that crazy on him. And and you, you're you one and one. You're one and one right now in a situation. And you haven't been your best. You're, in other words, your dynamic pieces and your timing. I think a lot of this and, and, and what I would attribute to it, a large amount, and we're running out of football time because we're getting ready to dive into some basketball with our next guest here, uh, from from the Pac-12 is going to be joining us in studio. Uh, you what you're losing is, is Tom is is that, you know what you're not what you got to look at is, 
is that what makes you your best it's kind of like you haven't shot your best shot yet. You have you have, you you haven't you haven't used your secret weapon. If you are in a war and you 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 haven't dropped your atomic bomb, you haven't used your your crazy jet that that has this crazy ability or whatever, and you're still in the war in a good situation, you always know that you got one more punch to throw. Right. Yeah, you feel solid, like you got something behind you. Yeah, get, behind you. Yeah, you feel like you got something that's going has a chance to take you to another place. Right. And and I like to conclude, you know, uh, in in the fact that 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 the, that the NFL stands for not for long. Right. And two reasons that the NFL stands for not for long. One reason is is the simple fact that that the scout you admitted you, you talked about it earlier is that you have these large staffs of people with all this technology and all this analytics, and they are constantly studying you, and you got to try to stay ahead of that. Right. Other reason, which doesn't really apply to what we're talking about tonight, is is that you know your success in the NFL based on the nature of the sport only is going to last for so long. Mm. Well, you know the way I look at the Cowboys is the Cowboys have a tremendous running back in Zeke Elliott, mm -hmm. who is very similar. The, 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 the top five running back. I yeah. want to compare him to the Bears. Just bear with me for a second because it makes sense. Because that, Dak isn't a great quarterback. He's probably never going to be a great quarterback. But if you use Zeke right and you play your calls or you call your play off throw, of him the right the way, the way y'all throw great around these days, maybe he is a great quarterback. Who knows? Well, <laughs> I don't think you think he is. I don't think yeah, I think he is. I, I'm talking about the term, the whole definition of great. But I grew mm. up in a town where, where I, I think Chicago Bears quarterback is. Swahili for game manager. Our yeah. game manager is Swahili for that. But because right. the bottom line is, we never had a great quarterback. We won without a great quarterback. Mm -hmm. You could manage the game, but what you have to do is have a little bit of element of surprise. So I well, think they need it's, to keep... it's as much as what you do is what you don't do too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, does it not beat ourselves? And we think that 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 uh, you know, you have a situation with a Dak Prescott of someone that is a solid, like a good point guard, right? A solid facilitator that has a chance to involve some guys. And the last thing I want to say is is, 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 a, is a, the simple fact that did you see how good a job the defense did on what's supposed to be the, what the highest paid receiver in the NFL? They guarded him one-on-one -on -one yeah. all night long. I think that was a terrible circumstances. contract for New York to sign with OBJ. Well, I, I think I mean, it's but, good. But, 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 but he's good. We, right. we, we're not going to argue about how much money. We don't bother the man's money. But yeah, the fact right. is, he's good. He's talented. Right. But he's guardable because we guarded him. Well, I mean, maybe, 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 maybe our cornerbacks are a little bit better than we think. Maybe our defensive backfield, maybe, maybe we're a better defense. Well, than we and, and let me apologize for implying about the money means anything. Because I don't care about anyone getting their money. But what I've said, the reason I wouldn't have signed him is not because I don't think he's worth it. But who's gonna? Is he gonna throw the ball to himself in two years? Because Eli's not very good, and Eli's not getting better. Yep, you're right. Lone Star Sports Show right here on the Lone Star Sports Network. We come back. We're gonna go to the Pac-12. We're gonna take a look at the Ducks. We got a guy coming in that's passing through town. They're gonna come down and visit, and hang out for us a little while, and share a little information. And, and see if he can spread his winning ways around here in Texas. And why does he like to come back to Texas on a regular basis? We come back. We got Tony Stubblefield from University of Oregon, Eugene, Oregon, Final Four coach, uh, plenty of sweet 16s and elite eights. Been a big part of winning. And why does he always come back to Texas? Back in the Lone Star Sports Show in 180 seconds with more. Dude, this particular segment was brought to you by Fast Recruit with Fast Small Sports.
Okay, here we are back here at the Lone Star Sports Show on the Lone Star Sports Network. I'm extremely excited to have a client, good friend, long staple in NCAA Division I basketball, Tony Stubblefield. Tony, <laughs> you sneak in out the back door, but I caught you this time. <laughs> you caught me this time. I tried to get in and out without you catching me. <laughs> well, in the gym and here you come. Well, one thing I know about the fact is, is that all you got to do is like setting a mouse trap. <laughs> you got to put a play up there and get by the trap and just be patient. <laughs> if you put a play up there, there's a good chance I might show up. Good chance you might show up. That's what I, I can always count on. But, you know, what is this period to you all right now, uh, Coach? I mean, wh what's going on 365 days in a year? You know, you work a job that's, that's, that's a 24-7 job, a lot of commitment, a lot going on. You come back. You have one of the luxuries of your kids – probably a third of the kids are not even maybe even what less than that how many 351 division one schools how many people on the quarter system they're still on break right now their kids not even on campus it's probably only about six to ten schools um not, maybe not even ten that are on the quarter system so it really helps us i think during this period um we ha haven't even started school yet we won't start school until september 24th so um it's an opportunity for us really to hit the ground running, um, to get out and see as many kids as we can because, again, our guys haven't started school. Um, we did bring our guys back. Um, we can start working our guys out September 15th, and with the new NCAA rules, we're allowed to get um, four hours a week with our guys, so mm -hmm. we kind of spread that out throughout the week. But we really plan a lot of our recruiting around them days that we work out, but it's really, I think, an advantage for us during this period to get out and see as many kids as we can see during this time. That's 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 a that's a good deal. So, tell me what the roughly three to four. Uh, tell our listeners. I think you and I both know. What are the three to four periods that exist in a 365 day calendar, and how many recruiting days do you have, and what's the evaluation? What's quiet period? What's dead period? When are you evaluating but no contact? What do all those things mean? Mm. Well, you know, right now we're in the contact and we're in the evaluation. Um, stage right now so obviously the kids are back in school that we're going to recruit um that's the only place we can go evaluate the guys right now is at their school whether it's at a basketball period whether it's at an open gym whether it's at a junior college open gym so the only place we're allowed to go evaluate the players right now no, until, scholastic yes scholastic is I mean, until april is at their school mm -hmm. um whether they're playing in the tournament practice or so forth so this is a big period for us right now obviously in april in the spring, there's a lot of times we can really get an evaluation in and seeing the kids in the tournament mm -hmm. with their AAU team. So that's another area mm -hmm. that we got to lock in on. And um, obviously, July, all the kids are playing with their AAU team. So it's kind of broke up into three scenarios uh, with, the, you know, this being a big contact evaluation period. Obviously, April being a contact evaluation period and July being an evaluation period. So mm -hmm. this is a big opportunity for us to get out and see as many kids as we can see during this time. we got 130 days between now and May w that we can be on the road. So you got to use the days wisely, and um, it's best if you can see a multiple kids on the same day. Well, now you're hearing it from Tony Stubblefield. Uh, Coach, I mean, obviously I've known you a long time, all the way back to the days. You used to be a UTA Maverick. That's where it all started. Mm. My, my time in Dallas started good here in Arlington, Texas. Was here six years of the best six years of my life. Okay. All <laughs> right. If folks in Texas want to remember that. He put, put his plug in. Yeah, I remember he said it. He, he likes Texas. <laughs> but, uh, no, you, when you look back, and, and in actuality, we don't want to overlook what all went on with, with uh, Coach Eddie McCarty. At uh down in San Antonio with, at UTSA was that your first Division One job? My first Division One job was with Tim McCarter at UTSA. I, Tim, um, right. I was there a year before I came to UTA, but I um, was very thankful to get the opportunity to work for Tim. I had a great opportunity coming out of college, and you know was fortunate enough to get started you know as a full time assistant at UTSA. So um, that was a great year. It was a great learning experience for me. And I'll always be indebted to Tim Carter for giving me that opportunity. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. That was that was a time at that time what the, the UTSA was in the Southland Conference. We were in the Southland Conference. Um, yeah. So you cut UTA. your teeth twice in the Southland Conference. Coach, you've been a you've been a <laughs> you know sometimes you don't you take things for granted. You don't really add it up. But coach, you've been you've coached in the Southland Conference twice. I did. I did. At yeah. UTSA at UTA. So I really respect the Southland Conference. It's really good basketball. A lot of times when I see them guys on the road, I talk a lot about the towns that we visited back mm -hmm. then and just the programs. And good, that's some good basketball in the Southland Conference. Yeah, no, there, there's there's no doubt about that. 
And um, there you're rolling along. And I tell you what's, what's, what's really, really crazy to see all the guys that are coaching and it kind of dates you. I know he looks like a young fella. But he, he might be a couple couple birthdays older than y'all think he is when you start adding up his resume. <laughs> Far from a young fella. <laughs> <laughs> when you start looking at the guys that are coaching and, and where they've gotten to in coaching, I'm going to throw one at you, and you correct me if I'm wrong. Scott Cross, you recruited him, yes or no? I didn't recruit Scott, but Scott played for me at UTA. Okay, um, well. Scott was a very good player, very hard playing player, but mm. a guy that got – the very utmost out of his potential. And it was a pleasure to sco- coach him. And then the crazy thing about it is he joined our staff as soon as he got done playing. So it was a guy that I coached and had the pleasure of working, working with as well. With. Okay, okay. That, that's, a, that's an interesting angle. You know, um, and before we get out of Texas, I mean, and, and, and Coach sneaks in and out and he's had a chance to recruit some players. We're going to talk about that. we got a couple more segments to go here. But when you stop back and look at the time – that that you spent in Texas, and we're going to talk about career-wise. We know how you feel with family and having a sister here and all the different things, the ties that you have here. What do you think is the biggest thing starting out in Texas that prepared you to have the successful career that we're going to go ahead and talk about as we move along? I really think it's about the relationships that I developed in Texas. Um, Obviously, um, Texas is a very big state. Um, there's a lot of great players in Texas year in and year out. There's an abundance of not just Division One, but Division Two, II, Division Three NAI players that come out of the state. But it was just about the relationships, and I really think starting out at a smaller level where you just had to grind and grind on a regular day-in and day-out basis just to try to get your foot in the door. Mm-hmm. And obviously living in the Metroplex, there was a lot of people coming through Dallas to recruit. Um, as far as even other college coaches. There was a lot of tournaments in the area. So I really think that helped me as far as a base to just establish myself, um, just being in this area. So it was, you know, just a great opportunity for me, and I was just blessed to be put in that situation. Well, you know, Stubbs is, is, a, is a celebrity in the DFW area. Well, my text messages are starting to light up, tell Stubbs this, tell Stubbs I can't tell him everything, but I we get off the set, I, I make sure I tell him everything y'all told me to tell him. I won't let none of it go, Coach. <laughs> it might be some bad things to tell him. <laughs> but there, there are very few guys that, that, that get the relationship piece. It's an interesting thing. Um, and, you know, I mean, I know it's, it's, it's professionally uh, 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 okay for me to say as much as he's a client, much as I've learned from him, one of the reasons that I'm my success in this building uh, goes over. I say a third of everything I've done based on uh, co- co- guys coaching at the Division One level, a third of it goes to this man sitting to my left right here and to y'all's right. I don't know about all that, Branch. You're be, you being awful kind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 have, I, have to, I have to answer the bell on that. You, you never want to forget where you came from and, and the people at the time that actually showed you the 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 nature of how things operate and function and one of the things that you just talked about is is just a tremendous value and respect for relationships I'll tell you one of the weirdest things about about uh about being friends with a tony stubblefield we just you know we we both like the dallas cowboys so we watch cowboy games we play dominoes we do a lot of things it has nothing to do with recruiting in college basketball but no matter what city you go in in this country any major city you can be walking down the street you can be sitting in a bar. You can be going to movie theater. If you hang out and go in and out of the parking lot, somebody's going to drive by and holler the notorious world famous saying, Stubbs, <laughs> no matter where you are. <laughs> I've been I've been a lot of places with this guy. And I say, Stubbs, who that? I, I'm not sure. I didn't get a good look at him. <laughs> so be wild. And according to my staff, we got a celebrity in the house tonight. <laughs> I don't necessarily know if that's a good thing, but they might be yelling at me for the wrong reason. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the people, you know, and the thing that I attributed that to, Coach, is, is how you respect relationships. You treat Barack Obama just like you treat the guy that sits in front of the barbecue place over in Cincinnati on the hill. <laughs> there used to be a place I used to work. I used to go work camp back. This was probably 10, 12 years ago. And every day we would pass by, they would come and pick us up to go to work, and we would pass by this one barbecue place. It was about three old dudes sitting over there. I don't know what they were doing. What are they doing sitting over there? They were sitting hanging over there. Out, just they, hanging out, just hanging out, relaxing. But, but when they see Coach's car, Coach, <laughs> they just scream and holler at him. He'd drive on by, he'd wave his hand and every single day. You know, and I often think that, and this is not necessarily basketball specific, the one thing I think that attributes to your success, and we're going to go on and talk about your success as we move on through, 
is the fact that you respect and recognize everybody. We well, you know, I do Tell think me relationships are very strong. And again, you know, it's just not about a player with me. It's just about sincere relationships. And um, obviously in this business, you get out and you get a chance to meet a lot of different people. Um, so I really like meeting different people, um, talking, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I've just come across some great friends, obviously, you being a very big friend of mine and um, our relationship evolving over time and just the times that we have. But I'm just very big on relationships. And um, I've been fortunate enough to meet a lot of good people in this business. Um, people that aren't even in the coaching business, but we run into a lot of different people through airports and just the traveling that we do on a regular basis. We've got about, a, about two minutes, or probably about one minute and 45 seconds. When you cut your teeth here in Texas, and, you know, and we're going to come back and talk about how good Region 14 and Region 5 have been to you, and we talked about all the, all the things that go on in Texas and how good of a process that is, uh, with you guys and what you all are able to, to, to accomplish through the junior college system. And you can compare that when we come back and talk about how what it's like to have a Region 5 and a Region 14 in a state like Texas and, how, you know, how many reasons there are to come from there. But as we get ready to break out, just give me a quick 30 or 45 seconds. When you had a chance to go, and I remember it uh, j just like yesterday, uh, had a chance to go to Las Cruces, New Mexico. What was on your mind at that point? and you were leaving Texas, where you had done the majority of your professional career, all of your professional career? Um, obviously, you know, it was a hard decision for me to leave this area um, to go to New Mexico State, to Las Cruces. <laughs> but I just felt at that point in time in my career that it was time for me to move on. I thought we had did some really good things at UTA, and I thought I kind of was ready for the next step in my career and um, had the opportunity to work for a Hall of Fame coach in Lou Henson, mm -hmm. um, to go to a program like New Mexico State who had had some success, back to uh, Coach McCartney. So um, I just thought it was a great opportunity, but again, at the same time, it was a very tough decision for me, but at the same time, I you knew. go to the desert, Coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, you know, Las Cruces ain't that far from Texas. You know, it's only 30 <laughs> minutes from El Paso, but it's still a long ways from Dallas. But I knew I would be coming back to this area to recruit a lot. So, again, I was gone, but at the same time, I was still here on a regular basis. But uh, well, was Tony Stubblefield got away. To this, this is the guy that, that coined the phrase, we get ready to go to break. This is the guy that told me, he said, Brent, you got to sleep quick. <laughs> so he, 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 he doesn't get a whole lot of rest. You know, he gets most of his rest on planes and, and, and in hotels and – and things of that nature, and he's just been cut out for it. We come back, we're going to talk more about how he goes about the process of identifying, evaluating, and then the recruiting part kicks in. I think that's a little bit of confusion in our industry of really understanding how all of that goes and what makes that work the way it does. And most people want to get right to the recruiting. But a lot goes on before the recruiting starts. You guys right here on the Lone Star Sports Show on the Lone Star Sports Network. This particular segment was brought to you by the Lone Star JUCO and, and Prep show, Showcase that will be out at Drive Nation October the 5th and 6th. Lone Star, Sport, Lone Star Sports will be there. In, 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 uh, actually, Lone Star Sports Network will be there supporting the process. Is doing one of the evaluation process where we will have Division I junior colleges, high school kids, and fifth-year post-grads. And we usually get anywhere from 50 to 100 Division I coaches that come through to take a look at the process. Back in 180 seconds with more Lone Star Sports Show.
Hey, here we are back at the Lone Star Sports Show. Today's show is brought to you by Fast Small Sports. We appreciate y'all joining us out there on TX Boys Basketball with one L on Periscope. But if you want to chime in and get the full effect of things, you need to go over to YouTube Live, the Lone Star Sports Network channel, where you can go and see back shows, where you can go and look back and see if we really said what we said. And uh, you can hold us accountable to what we said. We come back. Today's show is brought to you by FastMallSports.com. Obviously, this segment is brought to you by Hardham Hotels. But we, we were talking about, we were going to come back and visit the fact we got we got a, a future Hall of Famer. He just don't know it yet. Yeah, I sure don't. I hope so. <laughs> I hope you're right about that, Branch. <laughs> I, I forecasted it right here on, on, on the deal. So I, I, I'll have it. It'll be living right there. Yeah, you it ain't going it. To, I'm going to record this. <laughs> record it. It'll be a Hall of Famer. Uh, it, it, that that left the great state of Texas, went out to Las Cruces, New Mexico, different atmosphere. Uh, everyone knows that New Mexico State has a, a great reputation of recruiting Texas kids. Now, I'm getting a little forgetful, Coach. Were you – you were there with – none with Reggie. No, I was there one year with Reggie Thieves. One with Reggie. So, Tyrone Nelson. Tyrone Nelson. Okay. <laughs> yes, make yes, a little sir. smile on his face yes, there. Uh, yeah. That, the, the way you reached out. So, And you, you recruited a couple other kids. One other kid from Kimball High School – to Chris, the yes, Chris Jackson. Chris Jackson. Ten, that came from Garden City Junior College. And right. Played for Coach Snoop Johnson, who Snoop Johnson did a great job with the young man. And he went to Garden City and played for Jeremy Cox. And uh, mm-hmm. was very fortunate to get him at New Mexico State, but came there and had a great two years for us. Yeah. No, that, that's exactly right. The whole Tyrone Nelson. And we're missing one. We, um, David Fisher. Okay. South Oak Cliff. South Oak Cliff. That's right. Yes. Now, yes I, I, that, that had to be Mays. That had to be nineteen ninety seven, six, seven, seven, Ooh, eight. I think it was seven, eight. Seven, eight. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Sir. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. No. 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 It was two thousand two. I think. Was it that far down? Yes. Yes. It was two. So that was right along that same time, David. No, that was that was a little before, after, before that. Okay. So that was. Yeah, no, yeah. Texas was hot then. Chris Bosch and all those kids would come through. That was exactly, exactly. yeah, yeah, they were. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Fisher, I remember. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. Played for Coach Mays right there on Marcellus. He used to coach over there at South Oak Cliff uh, right there. What was that 2600 uh, Marcellus Street, y'all? Yeah, <laughs> Most, yeah, there you go. South Oak Cliff Bears. Y'all got a shout out right here. Got the Tony Stubblefield talking about y'all. You spent a lot of time over there. So you know your way over there, don't you, Coach? Yeah, you know I where know it is. Way pretty well around there. You know, Sox <laughs> had a great program. Coach Mays is a great coach. And, um, you know, the thing about his kids, when they got to college, they were very well prepared. So, mm-hmm. you know, he did a good job with those guys. But, again, not just Coach Mays, but a lot of guys in the Metroplex. There's a lot of good coaches in this area, and that's a reason why I think this area is so heavily recruited. Yeah. It can – let me ask you a question. Can Texas support the attention that it gets? Without a doubt. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I don't think there's a doubt in my mind, and I don't think there's a doubt in a lot of coaches' minds in the country. Um mm-hmm. There's a lot of very, very good players. There's a lot of talent in this state. And, um, again, I think Texas used to be looked at as just for athletes, but I think that's changed a lot over the course of the last five to ten years where these Mm -hmm. guys are really Mm -hmm. basketball players that are talented, ready to come into college and make an impact right away. So Mm -hmm. it's just not looked at as, you know, going to Texas just to get an athlete. You're going to Texas Mm -hmm. to get a legitimate basketball Mm -hmm. player who's been very well coached from his high school coach to his – AAU coach or whoever it may be. When you start looking around, and coach, I mean, you recruited uh, what's the kid out of New York? You recruited to Cincinnati, Lance Stevenson. Lance Stevenson out yes. of being in New York, and you recruited other New York players. You recruited some kids from Florida. You recruited internationally. Obviously, you, that's why you get ready to trade off to the LA Rams because you know, <laughs> you've been having so much success in Los Angeles here lately. So now you're a Ram fan. I'm an Dominic Sue fan. I'm, I'm, I'm with Sue. That's my Dominic man, Sue. Sue. Okay. Yeah, all right. Big all right. fella. Okay. I know how all that goes. We're not going to talk about that. That's the power of the swoosh. <laughs> yeah. It's got a little bit to do with it. <laughs> power of the swoosh. One thing about it now, I, I respect a lot of things about Nike. They make a great product, and I have a lot of close friends, this being one of them. That are, that are that are that are entrenched. I mean, Coach Ravelin is somebody. I, mean, I can just go on and on down the list of the Nike people, but I respect the loyalty and the commitment toward excellence that they do as a family. I say I say that you know, and my, my you know Kevin Plank and the rest of the guys probably gonna get mad at me for saying it. But yeah, I, I I'm a little nervous I, sitting next to you in this shirt you got on too, Branch. <laughs> I did recognize that. You know, <laughs> since you're a good friend, I'm gonna stay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Nah, hey, you man. see, that let y'all know it, 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 it's something that go go goes beyond the big the big the bigger picture. <laughs> no, nah, it's but, all uh, fun and games. A, it, it is definitely all games. <laughs> I mean, if fun, if fun, if fun come and go, coach. <laughs> I got you. It's a lot of working games. How about that? I understand. I understand. No, but no, we we all in it, and you know, and that's that's the beauty of it is, is that how many lives. That's the one thing I respect is that. When Tony Stubblefield gets a kid, he embraces that kid as a human being. Mm. Uh, that That's one of the things I've had a chance to observe from a long distance, from a closer distance, from various ways. And there's there's a there's a dynamic relationship. No matter what country they come from, no matter where they come from, there's a dynamic relationship with 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 Coach Stubblefield and the family and the kid. And, and it has nothing to do with basketball mm, uh, a large percentage of the time. It has the big, do with the big pitching. I mean, okay, I know you coach a bunch of draft choice. Well, you had five, four, four guys get drafted last year or something. A couple yeah. years ago, couple two years, years ago, yes, Two sir. years ago. But, you know, you look at a kid like a Jordan Bell. Coach saw something in Jordan Bell, wasn't getting recruited highly. I mean, coach might have been even scratching his head. And so, you know, I know you get the Bobos and, and the guys let y'all get in like that. But, Coach, you had a lot of success – with guys that weren't necessarily crazy radar guys. And I've always admired your ability to build a relationship with a kid and make that kid really want to achieve his best. <laughs> How does that work in, 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 in college basketball, Coach? You know, w- one thing, you know, that you know, I've never really tried to do is, is look at rankings and base my recruiting off of rankings and things of that nature. Um, I think you got to recruit the best fit for your program. And, again, you say a guy like Jordan Bell who wasn't ranked, you know, in the top 75, might have been ranked anywhere from maybe mm. 90 well, to 110. Well, even the top 100, Yeah, you yeah. know, so, <laughs> again, it was just a matter of, you know, a need that we had at Oregon at that time and just the potential that we thought. Now, at the same time, um, I think that's when you got to do a lot of research in the recruiting process to see, you know, a young man's work ethic and his drive to make sure that they'll work to be able to achieve their maximum potential. So, again, you know, I would like to take all the credit for it, but them guys come to Oregon, the places I've been, and they work extremely hard. And, again, I think it's a lot to do with the relationships and getting to know the families, the coaches, the AAU coaches, just the people that are very involved in this process. And one thing I've always tried to take great pride on in recruiting a young man, if they decide to come to Oregon or not, you know, they only can pick one school. But if they do, you know, I get to know the families very well. And I just always tell them this is not a one through a four-year relationship you're stuck with me for life and I really tried to pride myself on that and again you know all these guys aren't going to make it to the NBA some of them are going to have to you know get jobs some of them will go overseas after four years some of them will get out in the real world and you know get a nine to five so you know whether he gets a nine to five or makes it in the NBA I still want to have that same regression relationship with all these young men you've proven that coach you 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 really truly have proven that I'm going to throw another one out there for y'all uh, Damian Dotson mm. was a kid that was terribly under recruited uh, and wasn't getting much till late. I think Texas Tech came in late. U of H was not recruiting him; they were right there in, across the street from his high school. Uh, this is a kid that played the five for, for 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 a summer team, accepted his role. What did you see other than than the scouting service guys in Texas saying this is a kid being overlooked and getting some different the high school coach thing this? What did Tony Stubblefield and Dana Altman see when they came into that jungle there at Yates High School and guys were flying off the walls and all this basketball was playing? What, what did you, how did you able to extract that out of there in the two, one Elite Eight and one Sweet 16 with him? Well, let me say this. Um, we would have never had the opportunity to get the program turned at Oregon without Damian Dotson giving us the opportunity and him choosing Oregon. Mm-hmm. Um, he is a very loyal, hardworking young man. Um, who just came and put his best effort out on the floor every day he stepped on that court. And um, when we went and watched Damien, you know, we looked at Damien as a guy that could do a little bit of everything. He could play multiple positions. He could guard multiple positions. And he played extremely hard. You know, Mm -hmm. Coach Greg Wise had did a great job with him. Um, Chris Gaston, the guy that had been, you know, worked him out, Mm -hmm. had did a great job of continuing to develop him. But, you know, he was just so coachable. Mm-hmm. And, again, you know, we, we, we owe a lot of the success that we've had to Damian Dotson, his mother, Lori, and they've been very, very great people for us to work with. 
Um, obviously, it was a situation where he didn't stay at Oregon the whole four years. But, again, he was able to go to University of Houston, bounce back, and now he's playing with the New York Knicks. But, uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's just as a guy that I stay in contact with on a regular basis that's been very loyal. And, um, you know, we owe the world to him. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a pleasure to coach. Mm -hmm. um, nobody would have thought he could come to Oregon and make the impact he made right away. But he was a starter as a freshman on a team that went to the Sweet 16, and he played a big part in that. Okay. But, again, it had a lot to do with his work ethic, his determination. And, again, if you would have told – somebody that Damian Dotson would be in the NBA when he was coming out of Yates High School, they probably would have looked at you a little strange. But mm -hmm. it just shows you with a strong work ethic, with a will, mm -hmm. and just, you know, just continuing to work on your craft would do for you. Coach, we're going we're gonna to throw something. We're going to play a little game here real quick. I'm going to throw a word out, and, and I'm going to give you roughly about, about 30 seconds to describe not necessarily – just the University of Oregon men's basketball, but Tony Stubblefield. That's who we have here, the personality of a Tony Stubblefield. <laughs> when I throw the word out to you, we, I'll, I'll give you all the words. We're going to go identify, we're going to go evaluate, and then we're going to move to recruit. And I'm going to let you just – just ramble. You can say words that don't have to make sense. There'll be fragments, incomplete sentences. So I only get one word on this branch? No, no, you get multiple words. Oh, I'm going to give you one word. I get one word. I get one word, and okay. you get 30 seconds. Mm. I got you. I yeah. got you. Identify. When you think about your job and identify, what you comes know, to mind? My job is to develop young men. Um, when I go into a home, um, they're and, sitting and the word, the word is identify now. We identify. Mm. So the word is identify. The word is identify. So you're saying I did what I'm identifying in a kid. Yeah, when you're identifying a, a talent. We might have to go to the break. They, well, they, I tell you what. You say identify a hardworking, loyal. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's an interesting word. We come back from the break. We're going to pick back up. We're only going to use five of Tony, Tony, Tony Stubblefield's 25 seconds on the word identify. We're right here on the Lone Star Sports Show on the Lone Star Sports Network. Get in the end like it is. All things sports, all things Texas right here in the heart of North Texas and Oak Cliff, Texas on the Lone Star Sports Show. Today's show is brought to you by Fast Small Sports. We are blessed and lucky we have Tom Emman, our co-host here, that took us down through the football process, and now we have Tony Stubblefield. And as always, we have Lady Life and the Prince, Uneven Money, keeping us where we need to be, and yours truly, Alan Branch. Back in 180 seconds with one more segment of Tony Stubblefield. <laughs>
Hey, here we are right here at the Lone Star Sports Show on the Lone Star Sports Network. If my man Snoop Johnson was here right now, he would tell y'all we're at the top of the hour. And what Snoop Johnson would say, we're at the top of the hour, Brad. Top Brent. of the hour. Top huh? of the hour. <laughs> my main man, David Kaysan, down there. Go about, oh, no, that's right. The, the, all the, all the, the, the hurricanes are a little bit north of Florida right now. Kaysan, my man, he always comes back into Texas, got a home here. We enjoy having you. Appreciate you joining in, man. I had a long talk with Pooh. Uh, then your name came up a couple of times. It's all good, you know. It's, it's your boy Pooh. He he gonna he gonna reach out for you and make sure make sure that you even when you know even when you absent, Pooh gonna try to make sure you're in good standings. <laughs> but we're right here at the Lone Star Sports Show. Actually, you and Pooh both are in Florida now. How about that? I just thought about that. Miami and Florida Atlantic mm, doing what it does. But right now we got Tony Stubblefield from the University of Oregon in Eugene, Oregon. Coach, we were we were playing a little word game here. Yes, and sir. we said we said identify. Mm-hmm. When I when I say the word to Tony Stubblefield, twenty some years as a Division One assistant basketball coach, and we left out. He was the interim head coach at New Mexico State there in Las Cruces when Coach Henson fell ill. And, and, and this is always one for the ages. Inside joke. Anybody listening knows. Tony Stubblefield was the head coach and Mark Shue was the assistant. <laughs> Mark Shue was there with me. <laughs> a, a very good hey, assistant. He's uh, doing big things now. They, they, they were getting it done. <laughs> yes, sir. But uh, that, that, that was during that time. So that was your head coaching experience. And then you you leave there and you go to Cincinnati. And we're on the word identify. How does Tony Stubblefield go through the process? you got 30 seconds, uh, actually about 27 seconds to talk about identifying. When it comes to a young man. Yeah, players. You know, I think the first thing I try to do is identify the character of a young man because, you know, I know the type of people that we want in our program. So that's very important to me is the character, um, their work ethic, um, the coachability. Um, them are all things that are a big part of any young man being able to come to Oregon or wherever it may be and be successful. Mm-hmm. So, that you know, I think that's big just to um, – identify those things, talk to a lot of people around the kid that know the kid very well and, um, you know, come up with an answer to that. So uh, that's pretty good. That's, that's really, really, really good to the fact of is that in the identifying process, obviously we know the, the, the basketball acumen has to come to some point, but even when you have when you have identified a certain basketball talent, that's when the process starts to really start to – look in and we start transitioning into our next word. I'm going to hold it just for a second. But in that identification process, you, you, you're checking boxes in. Is that what I get out of that a little bit? Exactly. Some box checking going on. You, you know, you, you, again, when you identify, then I think that's when you got to start digging down into the character of that young man that, you know, and, and finding a lot of personal information or as much personal information as you can find out. Mm-hmm. That's one of the things that comes back around to, to where we are these days in social media. One of the things that Fast Small Sports does with Fast Recruit, it takes in all the social media visits. So you see a lot of things that are going on in a kid's life. Right now, when you're in the identifying process, you, you frequent take a look at the, at the social media and see what's going on, yes or no? Oh, very much so. And um, when I'm not frequented, um, we have two or three guys in our office that are following all the young men that we're currently recruiting mm-hmm. that we possibly might be recruiting in the future. And again, if there's any warning signs, if there's any red flags that come across their social media, um, we know immediately. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, to a lot of these young men out there, you know, be careful with that um, mm-hmm. because with us, once you put it out there, it's out there. Mm-hmm. And, um, again, coaches are watching. And, um, again, we tell our guys to even go to the next level. The people at the next level in any NBA are watching. And we have a lot of social media training for our guys mm-hmm. just to let them know the do's and don'ts of it. Okay. We move out of the word. We're going to go to word two right now. We're going to go to the word of evaluate. Now you have – you've checked enough boxes – and you identify, we kind of see a little bit of an overlap. I never really thought about it like this, but there's a little bit of an overlap in the identification process and the evaluation process. Now you've identified enough that you're full-fledged on of evaluating. What are the areas that you, you're you evaluating a player, a pro- prospect, or the NCAA like to call it a PSA, a prospective student athlete? Well, you know, again, um, I've been fortunate to work for Dana Altman, um, who's been a head coach for 32 years. And, um, mm. 
you know, I think it's your job as an assistant, an assistant, excuse me, to evaluate what he likes in a player. Because again, once you've been doing this a long time, um, you're not going to change your style of play up overnight. So again, when it comes time for us to evaluate, we got to evaluate how they fit in our system, um, how athletic they are, how you know well they get up and down the floor, you know how skilled a young man is, and we got to take a lot of those things into consideration because again. It could be, you know, a, a very good player, but again, if the fit don't fit, then it's not going to work for either party. Mm -hmm. So again, we got to take it, you know, into consideration the skill level, his athleticism. Um, can he play multiple positions? Can he guard multiple positions? Um, how well does he move laterally and so forth? So a lot of that comes into the evaluation process for us when we're evaluating the prospect on the floor. So you know. Uh, I do know that about about Dana Altman. You're right. You know, you see a lot of things in, in in a lot of the successful programs, and even at the NBA level, versatility is important. You know, uh, defensively and offensively. What do, you know when you start something that jumps out at me is, is positionless basketball. You know, I think that a lot of of our grassroots world and our high school world is still trying to put players in. He's this or he's that, and and that's kind of okay, but the diversity or the versatility of a player in the evaluation process weighs heavily. Yes or no? Oh, it weighs very heavily. Um, and, and we tell guys all the time, you know, we, we don't we don't we don't number our guys. We just we, we you're basketball players. We like guys that are very versatile that you can play in multiple positions. Um, our team that went to the Final Four, we played Dylan Brooks a lot at the four, mm -hmm. um, knowing that you know, you know, if you want to put a number on it, you know, that would have been what he was out there with Jordan Bell. But again, he was a basketball player that just had the ability to be able to make plays, <laughs> and that helped him get to the next level. Um, just him up, you know, being able to play multiple positions, and uh, that's what we've been very big on: is guys like that being able to play multiple positions that we can move around. And remember this: the more positions you can play on the floor. The coach will find more minutes for you, um, hmm. but if you're locked into one position and you know, being able to only do one thing, you're going to limit yourself. Well, that, that that that's a that's an interesting piece on it, coach. I I told him he had to have a hall pass. He coming here right in the middle of the examination, coach. While we try to get some work done, he been down there sneaking off, hanging out down there in Houston on the chop shop. Doing hanging out with Hatter and and, 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 and my man down there, a, 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 a cheat sheet. And now he comes in. I'm not even sure if your card even work. Are you are you connected, Snoop Johnson? They didn't even turn you on over there, coach. Your hall pass ain't working good. I'm, I'm connected. I'm connected. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I had to give him the okay tongue. Say, go ahead and let coach in. <laughs> you gotta let my man Snoop Johnson in. Hey, I just called. Hey, I just called in to tell Stub that Stub sitting in a he's sitting in a powerful seat. See, Tom that's Tom that stepped in right now. And he ain't letting you off the hook. Stub letting you off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> and if they didn't, my supposed, man, Stub Snoop. Supposed to be, you supposed to be cowboy. You supposed to be cowboy stuff. You supposed to be giving it to him right now. <laughs> oh, Coach, you ain't heard the whole story, Coach. He's he been out there hanging out there at L.A. Live, and <clears throat> he done got confused. He got that little swirl on his head now. He done, got, he done traded his star, been having a good time oh, out, there, know, out there in L.A., and went out there and got him a, a five-star, one-and-done dude. Hey, and, hey oh, Snoop, yeah. don't go for it, but Snoop, I do like the Rams this year. I done took a hard look at them the last <laughs> two weeks. And I, I do like them Rams. Hey, I like the look hey, of them. Hey, Coach, you took a hard look at L.A. Live is where you took. Tell him over there at Arlington. Y'all got Arlington Live. Over there now. No, no, we got Texas Live. Texas bro. Live, Texas that what y'all call it? Okay, Texas, Texas, Texas Live. live. Texas it, it, live. it wasn't no Texas, Texas live. live when I was at UTA, Snoop. You know, <laughs> they were playing on it was, Snoop, it was just the Rangers over Stubman there. Stubman were playing on the stage. <laughs> the stage, you had to get it done on the stage. Hey, you got a brand new hey, arena like I, over there. Hey, like I tell all the, all I tell like like I tell all the former players that come over there right now, and they say, "Man, we didn't have this, this, and that." I say, "Hey, man, it's all you always got to look at. It should be better when you leave. If you did what you're supposed to do, it's better." So, so you got a point right there. Y'all did what y'all supposed to do for us to get off the stage. Stubs and and y'all gonna take it to away. another level. <laughs> y'all gonna take it to another level. I, hey. I, I, and I know that's gonna happen. Hey, sport, sports resources, coach. I'm counting on you, coach. You, you, got, you, got, you got it all right there. You ain't ready to find print when you throw winning championships. So we gotta come sit down again. <laughs> 
But no, man, we have a good time. You've been down there in the Bayou City, man. Stuff don't, don't, don't run down to Houston like it used to. You like you get up in the metro. Oh, I'm coming back. I'm coming, coming back. Tell you tell Chief Sheet and them I'm coming on down there. And you <laughs> yeah. know, let, let Chris Walker yeah, know I'm hey. coming down there too. <laughs> <laughs> Chris yeah, Walker trying to sneak off here and, yeah. and make him a swoop, swoop and go through everything and turn around and get right back out. Hey. Chris Walker ain't the only one hey. in the Pac-12 that right. can come down hey, there. Like, <laughs> hey, hey, Stug, Stug. Yes, sir. You, before you come down, you better call Chief Sheet and call them guys and tell them. They better stop. They better stop hiding all the players down here. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna figure it out somehow, some way. I'm gonna figure it out. But uh, hey, that was that was, that was, that was, a, that was a little bit inside Texas, Joe. You might be way up there in Oregon. You might not have caught that one, Coach. <laughs> I got what you're saying. They try to handle them, boys. I think I can loosen cheese sheet up. I take him to Papa Do. You know, we get a little something on the stomach. You think he'll be all right? <laughs> Get him, get him, go take a good, get a good look at it. Yes, sir. Snoop, when you when you coming back home, man? I know you're down there visiting and stuff. When I, I, you coming hey, back home? Hey, I'm, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm walking back to the hotel right now. I might jump in the car and come on back tonight. Yo, you know, you know, you know how I used to do that, coach. You don't take with two phone calls and you be back in town. No, that was. I, 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 I'll be back. I'll be back tomorrow. I got to yeah. make one early morning stop. You got to make one early morning, early morning practice. Yeah. I'm headed headed yeah. down there this weekend. Uh, John Lucas. They got me running all the play over the place. Scout Focus and then John Lucas got me lined up down there for the deal. We got a bunch of really good players. One of my favorite players. I'm gonna leave the state of Texas. And I keep on telling now. <laughs> I yeah, know who yeah. you gonna say. Ain't no one I'm gonna say. You're going down to Georgia with this people. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what was it? What's his name? Uh, 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 Unin keeps up with all the players' name. Anthony. Uh, Anthony Edwards Branch. I, yeah. I knew you was gonna say <laughs> Anthony, Anthony, Anthony Edwards. Georgia. Coach. Anthony Edwards gonna be in Houston, Texas this weekend, Coach. <laughs> yeah. Because they're like they're like they're like following Jay Z and, and Beyonce and them around. Oh, that's saying a lot now, Branch. I heard they did their thing over there in Texas Stadium. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Lou Johnson, y'all had. Yeah, y'all had y'all had Beyonce and, and Jay Z and them over there right there at, at, at Texas Live and in the middle of the Cowboy they was World. Houston, they, was in, they was in the Houston the other day and, and, and these people down here still talking about it. Still talking you know? about it. They say it's a show. That's what they tell me. They say yeah. it's a full blown, uh, bona fide show. It ain't a concert. It's a they, show. I think they were in Austin, <laughs> I think they were in Austin uh, yesterday. Everybody get. I saw Jay Lucas if, earlier. He didn't, he didn't say anything about. It. They were having to work a little bit. If down. Jay Z if Jay Z and Beyonce made it to Austin. Austin, Texas has arrived. You tell the folks I'm going to pass the baton. I'm going to let you come back into the Metroplex. I'm going to head now to the Bayou, Bayou City this coming weekend and get it in. John, John Lucas right over there at, at the SI3. If you want to see some high-level stuff, then I'm going to come back up to Fal Scout Focus and shake the bushes and find some more good ones, Coach. I'm get, you're getting your money worth out of me, Coach. <laughs> <laughs> Hit up down the road. We know how we are right here on the Lone Star. Coach, we just went past the, the top of the aisle. We headed down the backside, headed to the red zone right now in down here in Texas in the, in the middle of football season in Cowboy Land. Got Cowboy Snoop right here on the on the phone down hanging out in the Bayou City. We got Tony Stubberfield, University of Oregon, Final Four, Elite Eight, Sweet Sixteen. We just call him we just call him NCAA tournament. That I need to Tony. get back. That's, that's the whole deal. We'll be back with a, more of the Lone Star Sports Show. This particular segment was brought to you by HardemHotels.com. Hardem Hotels, where you can put your money where you sleep. Located right there in the Bayou City. I'm sure Snoop Johnson might be sleeping in one of our properties tonight and don't even know it. Missing out on some money. But, hey, here it is. All things sports, all things tech. We'll be back in 180 seconds with more of the Lone Star Sports Show.
Hey, here we are back at the Lone Star Sports Show. All things sports, all things Texas. The, the, final, the final segment with the Ducks, with Tony Stubblefield, with a future Hall of Famer, Tony Stubblefield, <laughs> <laughs> getting in. We got him all the way up to up to Las Cruces, and we got him headed to Cincinnati, right there with Mick Cronin, right there where they both get kicked off. I, I always look think about y'all when I see both of y'all at the same time. Both of y'all put in a lot of hard work over there in the nasty natty. Mm. Get it in. Grit. <laughs> <laughs> Grimy. <laughs> the Big East. <laughs> yes, sir. So, how, how tough was it to prepare with 16 teams in the Big East that y'all were living in at that time? Mm. You know, it was very challenging. Um, it was a situation where we, when we came in the city, in the Cincinnati, the cupboard was very bare. Mm-hmm. Um, it was only one returning scholarship player when we took the job. Mm. So um, we had to put together a team. And, again, you know, obviously during the late signing period, you got to try to sign the best players that are available. Um, a lot of the kids had already signed early. So, again, them early days, them early years in Cincinnati were very challenging. Um, and, um, you, know, you know, a little bit of the problem going into that is, you know, Cincinnati had had a lot of success with mm -hmm. Bob Huggins. Um, they were used to winning. They had had great players from Kenyon Martin mm -hmm. to um, Dallas Kip. Yes, mm -hmm. um, to um, Reuben Patterson. Um, Reuben Corey Patterson. Uh, <laughs> they, they had a lot of good players come Big through Ruben. there. So um, Cincinnati is not one of those cities that um, was used to being patient. But um, luckily, you know, they gave us some time, and um, it's paid off. Um, Mick Cronin was a great guy to work for. Is a great friend of mine. And he's really got that program now going in the right direction. Um, they've been nine straight NCAA tournaments. Um, and he, he got it turned. Um, yeah. But if you would have said that when we first took the job, that was in 2004 or three. It was in 2006. Six. What's that for? Okay. So yeah. we had Larry Davis yes. out of the class of 2007. We had, we, was the we first. had Larry Davis from Houston um, mm -hmm. that came there and helped us get that program jump started. Mm -hmm. um, Larry had a great four year career there. And, um, Coach, I feel like let yeah. you in on a secret. I'm interrupting your process here you a little could, bit because every time you get ready to turn the deal, you come down to Texas and get you a player. I, I ain't got no choice. <laughs> <laughs> Texas has been good to me, so I'd be crazy not to come. So te the Texas dude, you go get you a real good, tough, gritty Texas dude. He go in there and fight the war and get it, get it, get it going, get it pointing in the right direction. A lot of them have. A lot of them um, have. Texas has been very good to me and my <laughs> family. Let me say that. <laughs> but you know, them guys have come and places they've been where I've been. They've had great success, and um, yeah. we're going to continue to recruit the state. Yeah, that is that is that is that is amazing piece there. When you look at the situation of what you're able to come. Now we had a little word game going on. We've talked about identifying prospects. We've talked about evaluating prospects, and so many times the reason I bring this up and I'm trying to make a little fun and games out of it, and it's probably our fault in the industry because we use the word recruit so loosely. But tell me before I, before I give you this word and let you go on it. Tell me, is there a difference between evaluating and recruiting? And that's a yes or no, and then I'm going to throw the word. Definitely a, a major difference between evaluating and recruiting. Y'all heard it right on the Lone Star Sporting show, Sports Show. So you should have a clear understanding that recruiting and evaluating are not the same thing. Make sure you understand that. We're going to talk about some of the definitions of that because we want to be in a situation where, where we're educating parents, we're educating uh, prospects. I saw a couple prospects just jump on and chime in and listen. Was one thing about that old boy drawing me in a football <laughs> fan, track and field, even Mark Cuban. Uh, what's my man's name? Uh, uh, Kaepernick may be joining in before long. He got <laughs> he got a little love for a little love for the for the swoosh right about now. Well, that's one thing at Oregon. You know, it ain't just the basketball and football. Our softball has done well. Obviously, our track and field has done well. Man, um, Phil Knight told me something one time I'll never forget. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm getting ready to go already. I know where you're going with it. <laughs> he said, Branch, did, did, did he beat them all? <laughs> <laughs> they want to win. That's his definition of, uh, 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 of the best player. That means you beat everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> you got to outrun them. You got to jump them. You got to shoot them. Yeah. You got to tackle them or whatever. But that's the way he, he, he evaluates perfection. And I always had a lot of, a lot of respect for that, you know, uh, uh, a guy like Phil Knight and the way he goes about that. And it has a lot to do with the perfection. When you walk around the Nike campus, you can see the legacy of what has transpired with athletes at being being their best. And uh, so, you know, that's, that's a qual quality piece that, that you want to take away from there, and that's pursuit of the best. But now we're going to throw the word out to you, Coach, and you got a little time. You got roughly about one minute to deal with 
Define recruiting. Well, you know, obviously, recruiting a young man um, starts when you offer that young man a scholarship. Thank you. Um, that's <laughs> when I think it gets really deep. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, there's a lot that goes into that. And um, I think before that, you got to see academically where that young man is at. And I think a lot of people keep, skip that stage because, again, without being academically eligible, um, you, you know, I think people Could waste a lot of time. Fans. Yeah, <laughs> you, you know, you, you, you're, you're wasting a lot of time. So you got to see exactly where a young man is at academically to see, to make sure that they're going to qualify mm -hmm. to be able to come to a Division One school and um, be able to get into your university. So when you start recruiting, obviously, obviously offering that young man a scholarship, um, building the relationships with the young man's mother, father, guardian, um, whoever it may be that are very close to that young man, um, the high school coach, the AAU coach, and just everybody that is going to be influential in the process with this young man. Because, again, you're just not recruiting him. You're recruiting everybody that's a part of his group, um, part of his family, and so forth. And then I think a lot of that, you know, you, you got to be very visible mm -hmm. to show that young man how badly that you want him. Mm -hmm. And, again, a lot of times, you know, we're past the evaluation stage when we've offered the scholarship. I mean, we've seen what we need to see. We know we want you, and we're just basically um, trying to convince you how badly that we do want you. So mm -hmm. that's a big part of it. Again, you know, you got to evaluate a young man and kind of dig deep to find out the character of a young man, um, to find out the work ethic of a young man. And when you've done your due diligence with that and you offer that young man a scholarship, you really just need to start building those relationships because, you know, the relationships are very important and you want that young man to be comfortable with you, your university, your system, your program, and to have as much information as he can possibly have to make an educated decision. Mm. Uh, totally agree. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank and, uh, and appreciate coming from such a credible source to get the overall grassroots high school community of prospects, parents, and coaches to understand that the recruiting process does not start until the scholarship has been offered. Everything else is identification, evaluation process. Mm. And a lot of times guys get, get really, really confused about the difference of it, and they use the terms loosely, and they don't really understand what is going on at different phases. And, and because they don't understand what's going on at different phases, so a lot of times they will lose their traction of of knowing how they're presenting themselves as a prospect, how the family is presenting themselves as a person that's, that's nurturing and developing prospects. Mm. So as soon as two or three shirts show up, I like to call it, show up, then they automatically think they're being recruited and they stop putting necessarily their best foot forward from to, to to accommodate the identification and evaluation process. Yes. And that's the reason I'm, I appreciate it. I mean, obviously you and I know the difference in the two, but here at the Lone Star Sports Network, we're in the we're in the business of educating our community so that that our community can be more prepared to be successful because we have we know our resources, we know our population in the state of Texas is huge. We know they have a lot of things going on in Texas, but we can't do better until we know better. So when we get somebody like yourself here, it, it it helps. I mean, I speak at camps. I explain it all the time. But when you bring all the NCAA tournament, how many NCAA tournaments you been to, Coach? Who? It's right at about seven or eight. Seven. Seven. Yes. Two, four, four and three. Yes. Four and three. Right. And and you had the luxury of going to a Final Four. I got to skip over everything else. I got to spend the last time. I might go over. What, what, what? Once your career, you had done all things you had done. You've been successful. You recruited tons of Division One players, and then you get to a Final Four. You guys were in Arizona. What was that like to make it to a Final Four with everything else that you experienced in your career? You know, it was a great experience. Um, getting there is obviously very challenging. Um, the year before we made it to the Final Four, we got beaten at Elite Eight to Oklahoma, a very good team. Um, Down in Houston? No, it actually was in San Jose. No, it was in Anaheim. To go to Houston, right? Yeah, to go to, to Houston. Houston. I'm sorry, um, right. But, That's um, right. Mm -hmm. Got beat by a couple of good friends of mine, Lou Hill and Chris Crutchfield. So mm -hmm. if I was going to lose anybody, I wanted to be a couple of good friends. But um, 
But for us to come back that next year um, and make it to the Final Four was very gratifying. But again, once you get there, you know, it's just not about getting there. You, you know, when you get that close, you want to win it all. So there's still a lot of work to be done. You know, I kind of look back at the experience being there in Kansas City and going to the Final Four. That that was a tremendous experience, too, that when you realize and y'all cut the nets down, you know, and, I, and I, they, they all told me about how you guys just, just, you know, my buddy Bill Self pretty much had him a home court game and y'all went in with about 400 fans and about nine players and, and against – about eighteen thousand players, <laughs> eighteen thousand fans, and and the whole operation. Y'all got it done. When you knew you were going to that final four, just give me in about fifteen twenty seconds what that did to you from a career perspective or a perspective that you took about what's left for you in this business. Well, you know, it was very gratifying because you know starting in this business you know you always go to the final four so i had been to about 22 final fours as a um as a fan and you know you go to the practices you watch them you watch the games on tv with a bunch of friends you hope to get there so again it it was very gratifying but at the same time you know you work hard to get there you 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 want the magnitude of the stage like coach it's very big now you're playing in front of seventy five thousand, but i don't think you really realize what it is during that moment um, because you're so locked in on trying to win the game Mm -hmm. that you know maybe a month or two after that when you just sit back and think about it but again at the same time in this business you don't have a lot of time to sit back and think about it because you got to get back to work to try to get back there again famous words of Tony (laughs) Stubblefield you got to sleep quick (laughs) a lot of work to be done in this process love the business love friends like Tony Stubblefield coach I appreciate you coming on, man. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, and we're going to be back at 180 seconds with more Lone Star Sports Show. Today's show is brought to you by FastSmallSports.com, located in Chicago, Illinois, leading basketball into the 21st century through the vehicle of technology. This particular segment was brought to you by the Lone Star Juco and Prep Showcase, October the 5th and 6th there at Drive Nation, there where we'll have roughly 50 to 100 Division I coaches. We'll have about 14 Division I uh, junior colleges and another 16 uh, fifth year prep school and high school teams competing in a evaluation process. There'll probably be a little recruiting going on too. But y'all come on out and take a look at it. We're going to be right there getting it done like it's supposed to be done. Once again, we're blessed to have Tony Stubblefield and the Oregon Ducks here explain the process of what this period is all about every fall. Lady Life, Honey the Prince, and my main man Tom Emmon, get ready to join me back. We're going to take him out of timeout, and you're going to get ticking time, Tom, when we come back from the break. Long Star Sports Show, giving it to you like it is. All things sports, all things Texas. back in here at the Lone Star Sports Show, giving it to you on the Lone Star Sports Network. All the Periscope people have to duck off and come on over. I'm not sure how good a job they're doing at that, but we're going to get back down into it. Coach, what did, what, did, what did you think about what you listen to? All the basketball stuff you have sitting there listening to a guy like a Tony Stubblefield. Okay. And, 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 and listening to a guy like a Tony Stubblefield with the experiences that he's had and all the track record of going through the various jobs and success he had, talking about Texas. Well, I, I, everything that you heard, give me one thing. Ticking time, Tom, right now. Give me one thing that you could just truly identify with out of all the things he talked about. 
Um, the fact that you're not being recruited until you've been offered a scholarship. You're being evaluated. You're being evaluated. You're being evaluated. Um, and, and it's 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 a uh, it's it's clearly understandable why Tony's been so successful because he it, there is an aspect of fit and everything. I was telling you I think a couple episodes back I had a young man that uh, Loyola was looking at real closely. It, was, it would have been a good fit. It was a really good fit basketball wise and everything. He just didn't have the grades and mm-hmm. and there was a, there was no way you know like you, why do you waste the time? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know it's, mm-hmm. it's nothing personal. Mm-hmm. But all the stuff this whole this whole ball in motion thing starts when you're about 14 years old. You get a free you get a fresh start for everyone out there who's a ninth grader mm-hmm. or is gonna or still in middle school. When you mm-hmm. come back to high school, you be the worst student in the world. But when you go to high school, you get a reset. You go to zero point zero. Which can be four point zero after your first semester, and it's kind of like averaging. If you want to average twenty points a game, it's really a good, not a good idea to score three points the first game, three points the second game, and four the third. Mm-hmm. Right? Go score four to give yourself a wiggle room. There you go. Right? By the same coconut on grades, you got to be ready to go. And, and that might be one of the best, most informative ticking time terms that I've had. You just got ticking time term. He just identifies some really things I think that 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 should resonate and leave. Hope we can stick a key word in there. That's one of the things that we like to do at the cream of the crop. Is to understand, get, try to get young men to understand. And you look at Honey You Money with Five State Hoop Report and TexasBoysBasketball.com, where I work with Honey at those two entities, identifying prospects and in the process to understand that, that you really enter into reality, to accountability when you move into high school. All that stuff starts accumulating. You can't really hit erase anymore. Right. It's, it's actually a part of your – it's a part of what we know you of on the court. It's a part of what we know and visit and what we're able to see in your parents. It's what we're able to see with your transcript. It's what we – all that – you start to build that resume doing that identification and evaluation process. And I think so many times uh, the grassroots basketball, youth basketball community, Tom, doesn't really understand how important it is for them to to take serious and I see this in the, in 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 the, in the community all the time of, of youth sports or youth basketball especially is what I'm in is that they don't realize the identification and evaluation process and they want to move right over to the recruiting process and they don't understand the in-depth nature of when all of the identification and all of the evaluation is going on. And I don't think they understand the criteria. You know, there's a guy that's been here to, what, eight, nine NCAA tournaments, been through the process, been to Final Four, been to Sweet 16, been to Elite Eight. Been, he's done everything except win a national championship. Right. And he's still got another 12, 14 years probably left in his career. Got a good chance he might do it one day. And he just told you how in-depth and detailed the identification and evaluation process is. But for some reason, I'm going to ask you from go back to the other side because I'm always trying to solve some things. I want people to walk away. I want people to come back and look at this and say I learned something. Okay. Why is it so hard for people to take the identification and evaluation process seriously. Ego. Hmm. Ego. It's all ego. I mean, we have to have an ego to be successful in anything. Mm-hmm. You have to be a really, you have to have a, quite a big ego to be successful in sports. But, you know, there's a fine line between, you know, cock, cockiness and arrogance. There's a fine line between confidence and arrogance and that type of thing. So I just think at some point in time, I, I don't know, because there's a lot of people who are, you'll hear people say, well, I got a letter from, um, come on, man, come on. Who, who have you been offered by? Who has, who's offered you? That's your list. Right. And and, and 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 here's the crazy part about it, you know, Coach, is, is that it's funny you say that, and a lot of things are just kind of running through my head right now, and you say, well, what do you mean things are running through my head? When I look at the the summer coaches that are out there that are trying to utilize offers to prepare a certain image, and I, I just think so many times the process is being being muddied or confused 
about the accountability in the process. See, that, that's kind of my frustration. I think at times that, I mean, probably you probably look at me as a homer high school coach, but see, that's one of my problems is because people out there who I consider to be unqualified, who have no credibility, can say anything they want to and not back it up. But then we're we're kind of stuck with the after fact, the the aftermath. Hey, I, I thought about one thing, kind of a digression on the on the ticking time, Tom, in a really positive way. Mm-hmm. For those people out there who don't know how the grades work at NCAA, be aware of one thing. I'd be willing to bet, uh, Alan, right here. I'd be willing to bet you that Tony has not, in the last eight years at Oregon, ever recruited a JUCO player who was a non qualifier going into JUCO. Do you agree with that statement or not? Oh, I totally agree with it. I and mean, the reason is because you – I'll tell you what he has done. He's identified and evaluated, but the, the, that's what the people don't realize. That's what it got cut off. Right. But let me let me explain what I'm getting at with everybody out there. If you're a student out there who who is – if you're a qualifier in, uh, coming out of high school and you go to JUCO, you can play that one basketball season. You can get recruited at the end of that basketball season. And most most times you can actually go to the Division One school – in April or May of that of that spring of your freshman year. Mm-hmm. But if you go in as a non-qualifier, you have to go, you have to graduate, you have to have a 3.0 average. And my point is this, it's, Tony it's, Stubblefield, it's wait, 2.7, wait, or yeah. 2.7, okay. Tony Stubblefield is not going to wait around until May of your sec, of your sophomore year to hope that you've done what frankly you've never proven you can do. You never proved in high school you could live up to your academic responsibilities. Then you had to go to JUCO and they'll, like I said, you know, you can go somewhere, but it's not going to be Power Five. They yeah. can't wait for you. They can't wait for. Well, they won't wait for you. Well, they they they, they can't afford, and I think that's where it kind of some the ego. Sometimes people think they're so good, or there's so much of this, or there's so much of that, that they feel like people are going to wait. Uh, well, that's they, why you go to Sol Ross instead of Texas Tech. There's nothing wrong with Sol Ross. There's nothing wrong with. There's a lot of other places you can go to Southeastern Oklahoma State. No, or, you can go to, or you can go to junior college and yeah. go prove it. Mm. Yeah, but but or coming out of JUCO. Mm-hmm. As a non qualifier coming out of JUCO, you may end up going to Sol Ross because Sol Ross can't afford to wait because they don't have a choice, and Texas mm-hmm. doesn't have time to wait and doesn't want to wait. Mm-hmm. So that's, I'm just, I'm just preparing that. people for when you come in as a freshman, set that average high and mm-hmm. give yourself a legitimate chance. Well, I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, but it, it's it's I just think that guys need to understand – the 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 magnitude of the identification and evaluation process. Right, Go well, ahead, Coach. Let me ask you a question. I, I I know what I feel about this. Me and Barron talk about this quite a bit. If you talk to the average high school kid in Dallas, let's say he's between 13 and 16 years old, and you mentioned UTA, mm-hmm. what what would their opinion of UTA be? Fair or not, what would it be? Mm. It's not big time. Right, right. It's a little dismissive. I'm not saying hugely dismissive, but a little yeah, dismissive. Yeah, yeah. Not, not, not totally dismissive, but, but, a, but, a, but a little bit. Uh, right, and it's uh, annoying because I've known some of the guys who've been dismissed, and it's really annoying. And my point is this: well, what's, what's, what's annoying is, 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 is the level of the of the kids and parents that do want to take some kind of arrogant look down. Oh the yeah, yeah. No, my point is only this: for every kid out there who fluffs UTA, I call it fluffing them when you just blow mm-hmm. them off. Yeah. For every kid who fluffs. I want your, you and your high school teammate to take on the worst five players at UTA and watch you get your ass handed to you. Yeah, no, because it, it, you have no idea what you're into, and that's what kind of annoys me too. Because if it was as easy to be a Division One basketball player as everyone wants to think it is, mm-hmm. then we'd all be Division One basketball players. That's correct, that's right? That, that, there's that. limited numbers. There's limited. There's a lot of limitations to it, and, and what happens? In, and part of the part of the hustle for the dishonorable grassroots people. There's a lot of very honorable ones, but the dishonorable ones are taking money to create a, a, a false mindset with no accountability, which is to your point. The, the ones that are good, they're necessary. As they, as, as you, you do a great job. You have, very, you have credibility. You couldn't sell your service after 25 years if you had no credibility. Yeah, and, and you can't tell them that every car is a Maserati because some are Maseratis and some are Yugos. Well, well, you know what, Go. That's a fair point, and, and, and you're right. But you know one thing about that comes with credibility? What's that? Quality control. Well, I'm kind of thinking they go hand in hand. If you if you lose your quality control, you, that's where your credibility lacks. If you if you, I had a friend of mine one time that coached at Rice with Willis Wilson, okay. And Todd tells me he goes into high school one time in Houston, and the coach who didn't realize he completely lacking in self awareness turns to Todd and says, "Hey, I got three or four guys who can play for you." So Todd, of course, says, "Oh yeah, yeah, Coach Hagelson, tell me all about them." Mm-hmm. And in the, in the back of his mind, he's thinking, "Then where the f are all your rings?" Because if you got four Division One players, shouldn't you probably have some rings? Yeah, no, and, and, and there he is. And I mean, he got fluffed. Some... So Rice gets fluffed, kind of like that, and it's really annoying because the worst players at the worst schools are really freaking good. Well, I, I, I always talk about that at the JUCO level. Mm. Oh yeah, JUCO basketball is big time mm. athletes. You could take the middle of the road Region fourteen team or Region five team, 
And, and you know, one thing they would say, well, those kids are older. Okay, let's take all of the sophomores out of the process. Let's take let's take the best. Here we go. Let's, I got one even better for you. What's that? Let's take the best freshman in junior college. Okay, sophomores out, freshman only. A freshman one year only. removed from high school. One year removed from high school. Okay, and then we take the same group of 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 uh, another, I mean, excuse me, another group of, of of your really best high school players. Okay, and put them in the same gym. What game do you get? Mm. The JUCO kids would drill them. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if I told you the story, but someone asked me that very question when we won state. We had a really good team. I mean, we were we weren't very physical. Mm -hmm. We were we were and we weren't. It wasn't that we were a finesse team, but we we weren't real physical. Mm -hmm. All right. Someone said, "Do you think you could beat a JUCO team?" I said, "Are you kidding me? We would get beat into oblivion." Mm -hmm. And so, how can you win a state championship with a bunch of kids you love and then talk so bad about them? I said, "Come on, dude. Are you kidding me? The difference between a but even just the difference the, between 19 and 17 is tremendous." And and and, and the the problem. You know, when you look at – and I look at, you know, uh, Tony Stubblefield just left us and look at some of the Oregon teams, some things flashed through, and there wasn't just enough time to talk about all these things that need to be talked about. But he took an Elgin Cook kid that was in the state of Texas as a fifth-year player that was probably number 30, number 40 type kid uh, when he was in high school, didn't recruit him. He was Alvin. His father was a pro player. What was, was Alvin Franklin, I think? Was, uh, Alvin Franklin? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. His son, yeah. This kid went over to Region Five with uh with Green out of South Plains. Okay, ended up coming back playing probably as a twenty twenty five thousand dollar a month overseas guy, and was part of the Damian Dotson when they turned things around. And the understand the magnitude, and I, and I say this sometimes when I'm speaking to parents at camps. I probably will say it sometime during the course of this coming weekend. When you stop and look at the transition from boys basketball to men's basketball. You don't want to belittle that not one bit. I, I saw a fascinating piece of video where Chris Paul was talking to the point guards at the position mm -hmm. camps, and he was telling these kids, y'all are good players, you're all highly evaluated, blah, 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 blah. He said, you ain't taking my job, yeah. and you ain't taking no one else's job. These are grown men that are going to fight you for well, that job. Well, and, and, and that's where the whole accountability to the process and being being true to the process is about. We're going to break right here, right now. We'll be back. This particular segment was brought to you by HardhamHotels.com. Go take a look and see where you can put your money where you sleep. Dave's show is brought to you by Lone Star Sports Show. All things sports, all things Texas, right here on the Lone Star Sports Network. Tom Emman, Alan Branch, Lady Life, and my main man, the Prince, Honey with Money, giving it to you like it is. Hey, here we are rolling back here at the Lone Star Sports Show. We want to give a little shout out. I do not want to let things, all things sports, all things Texas right there from Tyler, Texas. Actually, not Tyler, Texas. I am drawing a blank. I got a main guy over here. Who, Jimmy? No. Uh-oh, no. We're not talking Jimmy. We're talking football. White House, Texas. White House, Texas. Boy, I tell you what. Mike Marcus, one of my close friends, would kill me if I could not think of the name of his town. But we want to talk about Pat Mahomes. 
and what he's doing Whew. and what is going on. Tenth in total passing yards, and that's that's in 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 the league right now. What he's doing uh, set a record for the most touchdowns thrown in the first two games. In other words, he's thrown more touchdowns this year in in an NFL two for, two regular season games, which comes to a total of ten. I can't think I can remember two guys that went five and five five touchdowns in two weeks. I mean each week or ten games. I think he what he go he went six and four. I believe mm-hmm. yeah. But in the end of the day, he got ten done. And he's second in the quarterback rating in, uh, at 143 of the whole league. And who's in front of him? I'm not exactly uh, sure. Ryan Fitzpatrick. Ryan Fitzpatrick. Which at 151.3. Who, who, who is on fire uh, uh, down in, 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 the, in the Tampa Bay in the, mm-hmm. in, the, in the great state of Florida down there. And they're hot. You know, I, mean, I haven't had a chance to take a real good look at them. I haven't put the you know, binoculars on to see how good they are. Like sometimes like I'll look at Atlanta Falcons and say, you know what, they're pretty damn good, you know. Uh, you know, you look at some of the non-Texas teams. Once I get set in, and there's not so much basketball going on, but I just want to reach out to Pat uh, and reach out to White House, Texas. All things sports, all things Texas. If you want to come get something special, you come to Texas. We got it in. You heard my main man Tony Stubblefield talking about all the success. Hey, it's in the books. Go, go Google it. Go look it up. We do I a didn't. pretty good job. Even even when we, we had to we had to. Uh, Trey athletes people in here, and they came up with some really, really interesting statistics. What were some of those numbers? You're pretty good at some of that stuff, Tom. What was it they said? Um, they're talking about the, the proportion. They're talking about the third highest proportion of athletes versus the expectation based on density of population, mm-hmm. something like that. Like there was twice as many people based on popular. The, the the raw number was we're, through, we're, was third. L. A. was first, but L. A. has got such a larger population that they said that, that they was like fifty percent correlation. Mm-hmm. They had half as many as you expected to get in a, in, in an area that big. And, we and had then two, Dallas had two one twice twice, as much, twice as much twice as much as, as you'd it. expect. So that's so, a yeah. huge monster. And I, I thought about that same statistic. Uh, and when, we're only the eighth I, biggest city told, in America. We're only number eight, so that's really out of out well, of whack. Yeah, and, but, but but you, you I'm, I'm gonna line in you a good up. way. In a good I'm, way. I'm gonna line you up there. We're we're not eighth. We're eighth in cities proper, but we don't live in that world. Well, it's a metroplex, anymore. right? I understand yeah, that. Yeah, it's a metroplex, right? Because technically, Houston's three, which I didn't realize. That's, that's right. Yeah, it's you, but, but we don't live in that world right, anymore. I, I agree we with we that. live in metropolitan that, that's areas hair splitting, now. Right. Yeah, it, it used to be a time where city you from. Cities don't matter anymore. It's municipal. I mean, excuse me, metropolitan, it's, it's metropolitan area. areas. Yeah, yeah. That, that metro really, Atlanta, Metro Orlando, Metro yeah, Dallas, that, Metro that's Houston. What, that's what tells it. I mean, of, of all these areas, this this is where where the population goes. I mean, because. You look at some place like Dallas, or you look at some place like Houston. You're only talking about two, three, four million people in each one of the places. But you look at the metropolitan area; it's twice 10, that, right, right. right? Exactly. So that everything that's being produced in the areas, the areas. But I still think it's apples to apples in in, in uh, Trey Athlete's comparison because what they were basically saying was metropolitan LA versus metropolitan Dallas. That's correct. Not that's necessarily were, LA versus Dallas. They weren't talking about LA, right? Versus and, Dallas, and so right. that's what. Well, and that's why what people don't realize is like I watch Jeffrey Okuda play. Well, Jeffrey Okuda's not from Dallas; he's from Grand Prairie. Mm. I watch you know all these different kids yeah. from Mansfield. They're not from Dallas. They're from the suburbs, so the suburbs count. Yeah, well, that, that's that's the way you measure. It. Take away all the way away from sports. When you start looking at the social, uh, economic impact and makeup, and all the political stuff, and how things and how districting of Congress lines and stuff are grown, right? Uh, and you know what areas that that politicians are trying to win. We're looked at as metropolitan. We live in metropolitan areas. Right. We don't live in city proper's anymore. Because if you really just want to break it down to a city proper, this is. Oak Cliff, Texas is what it used to be. Well, and the, let's you know, be honest with you. Most you know, of the cities are, are dwindling, waiting to get, get, come back on the regentrification thing anyway. So a lot, no there's, a lot, there's a lot of white, white and black flight out of the city. I mean, well, let's yeah. be honest. Well, what's, what's the predominant uh, – the, 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 the demographics are predominantly Hispanic now in the DISD at most high schools. In, in, in most both, of them. In both, Skyline's in, in, probably in, in, all black. In, in Roosevelt in, in, is. Well, you, you look, Sock might be, you, but most of them are probably predominant. Like I bet Kimball and Carter are – Close to fifty, if not. Roosevelt is predominantly Hispanic. Now. Oh, really? Even yeah. belts? Yeah, right. No, it, it is totally turned. Okay. Total not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just yeah. it is I mean, what it, it is. We're just talking about how things, things change, just change and right? evolve. Sure. So when you really want to look at the magnitude of what guys are looking at, they're you know, and we happen to be talking about sports and, and the success and, and the recruiting and the and the production of Division One athletes. You're talking about a metropolitan area. Well, you have to because especially with the transient nature of high school kids, nobody's going to sit there and live in a crappy neighborhood of any ur- uh, of any urban city. Like mm-hmm. no one's going to live in a horrible neighborhood in Chicago, New York, LA, wherever, wherever, when they're being shopped offers at other places because that's so common these days. Well, and, so and, you, and, you, know, you know, really have a, you really you know, have a lack of, of, of. You know what? I don't know the answer to it. I'm kind of cutting you off a little bit there, Tom. What's that? And, and, and not cutting you off because you were wrong about what you were saying, but kind of. 
throwing something out there I like to throw out there, mm. kind of like to go on record saying is uh, I was talking to Snoop Johnson and obviously I spent a lot of time in Houston. He's been in Houston for the last few days recruiting and uh, you know out looking at players and, and uh, he went over to Yates High School. Uh-huh. Which is in the area. Now they came in the regentrification. Is that how you pronounce that word or say that? Regentrification, right. Regentrification, right. 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 Yeah, define that. What's, what does that mean? Regentrify is when you take uh you take run down run down certain urban cities. I, I, I want to hear both both versions. I want to hear the lady life version too. It, it's uh it's rehabilitating run down urban areas. You know, turning like a good example would be turning uh warehouses into lots. I can, I, can, I, can, I can look at I can look at lady life. Expression and smile on her face, a smirk. It wasn't a smile on her face. Well, she can say whatever she wants. Uh, All uh, I there, said is she turned there, a lot there, into there, apartments. There's another version of, of, of this process, and that's kind of what I see. No, and, and it's that's also a, a way to, to drive poor black people out of their neighborhood. I get that. That's probably what she's laughing. I get that. Right. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, people care about money. And if, you're, if a, you're black and you have money, they don't care if you stay. It's not that you have to leave because you're black. You got to mm. leave because you're black and poor. Right. That's why you got to leave. Or Hispanic white and poor. Oh, and and white, white and poor, poor right. right. But poor it, people got to leave. So, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an economic thing it, that it happens. It can get looked at as a, as a racial thing. It but takes it, on it, a racial it, aspect because but we the get, underlying as, as, the underlying essence of it is economics. It's all. That's, right. I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. And that's what yeah, I got lady life with that. No, no, you're right, though, though. I got what you're saying. Nancy got that sense of approval look on her face. I always got to keep my politics. No, I didn't want you thinking, let's run them all out and don't give a damn. Yeah. No, it's. But, but, that is basically what you're talking about when you fix up an urban blight area. Yeah, and, and I knew the answer to that, but I just really want to kind of throw, testing us, huh? You know, not testing, but <laughs> I, I, want, I want to kind of set the ground, uh, the platform, or the groundwork for what I'm about to say. Okay. Yates High School. I haven't been back. To, I've been in Yates a thousand times for basketball games, and I probably literally mean <laughs> close to a thousand times, <laughs> and hundreds of times for sure, and. uh they have gone in, and you got that little corridor right there, Cullen, and and everything's going on in that third ward area. University of Houston will open up their new arena with the University of Oregon, University of Houston, there with a new arena. Got a new football stadium that's been built over there. Okay. The train is rolling right down, straight through a brand new, mm. pretty shiny white street. And guess what they just built? A brand new Yates High School. Oh, really? And Snoop Johnson told me it is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Well, but you know, that, that's that's kind of a trend because right now I live in an area at UTA because Snoop works there. Mm-hmm. He'll tell you the same thing. They're starting to develop a lot of that area in there that regentrifying old areas and it's it, it sprucing now, here, things here, up. Here, here's my deal. And this is, I don't, I'm, we're just talking. I'm just kind of brainstorming. What happens in a regentrified area when you come in, you, you, you make everything nice again and then these old inner city schools get these multi-million dollar makeovers and rebuilds and stuff and, 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 and all of the and all the STEM Academy stuff and the academics comes up right. to a certain standpoint and then uh, the facilities get way up here does it reverse back does the sports follow back in or do those places ever get rejuvenated to the Roosevelt and Sock that, that I, rivalry that I was a part of does it turn back into that? Possibly. That's. A good I don't question. know. I don't. I don't know. I mean, well, Lady Life is real smart. We might ask Lady Life. Uh, well, I think the obvious question is what kind of people are going to be going to that school? Because in theory, the regentrification of the neighborhood should change the demographics of that neighborhood. So, so it so should the, change the kids so, that go to that school in that neighborhood. Now, so, now people don't usually go to school in their neighborhood, so that shoots that philosophy in, in the ass. Right. So my my question is: in regentrification, does it have any any? Uh, uh, this is one of the things I was talking to a good friend of mine, Alvin Brooks, who's a, a associate head coach, I think, at a, well, I know he's at the University of Houston. I'm not sure if he has that title or not. But he's at the University of Houston, uh, Alvin Brooks Sr. And we were sitting in Duncanville talking about how we had seen things. Because he's an old Wheatley guy. And right. Roosevelt, and you worked at Sox. So we've seen the change. And right. I mean, I, well, I don't want to go into a lot of details, but we've seen the change. And we're saying with all of this development that's going back into these areas that went down and everybody went to the suburbs. Uh, and that's, this is kind of what I want to ask Lady Life. Are these areas conducive to people that are raising families? That are, that are Is it going to have anything to do with, with or, or will these be areas where where family people don't live? They will, they're not designed for kids to live in these areas. In these regentrified areas. Well, mm. my, my first reaction—I I don't certainly mean to chop off lady, lady life—but I would say it tends to be older people, retired people, single people that live in regentrified areas. And the other thing is when people 
Once people ever left Yates to say, let's just say go to Hightower or just you know name okay. a school. That's a good one. All right, Willow Ridge. Once they leave to go to, to just like, Hightower just like, just or Willow like Ridge, to go to Cedar, Cedar Valley. They're probably, Cedar, uh, Hill. they're probably not going to come back. I mean, I just started thinking well, about answering your question. I really don't think but, no, but, they but probably will never but, recover. But it's a it's a generational thing, though. Right? Too, no, very much. Well, okay, but here's the thing. So you're a Yates, you're a Yates alum. See, we're, but we're, are you, but, we're, we came out of the Sock and Roosevelt. We're right. grandparents. We're grandparents of the stars. And okay. DeSoto and Duncan. Okay, Field. but he, exactly. But here's an interesting question: If before they regentrified the area, would an old Sox star or an old Yates star have moved his kids from the suburbs back to a relatively bad neighborhood just to prove a point? Now the regentrified Yates, yeah, you might move them back. But now the question is, can you afford to move back to the regentrified area? Because now it ain't what you now grew you, up in. Now you just hit the point that I was really fishing for. It's not the. the way I don't think they come back. No, they, I don't. They don't, I don't come, see how it they works. don't come back because it's not conducive to the bang for the buck that most. Families and young families and the kid, are looking the, for. There, there's always the hot couple schools. There's no, not always just one school, but there's probably three to five or five schools the kids tend yeah, Lanc- to go Lanc- to. Lancaster, DeSoto, Cedar Hill, Duncanville. There you go. Right. That, that's fair. Right. That's yeah, reasonable. Right, right, all- right. And they tend to shift around it. And so while. And if anybody loses their luster, like right now, you know, Coach Peavy's biggest job is for Duncanville to get their luster back because they kind of lost it a little bit. He looked like they were getting it back today. Oh, no, no, I I, I wouldn't be able (laughs) to tell you. I know, I know, I'm not saying that. But based on up up until this year, I'm just coming to know that. Up until this year, that's a valid criticism. They were very average. Yeah, they were very average according to what the the history said. Yeah, yeah, the city of champions wasn't the city city of of mediocrity. I got got a good glimpse today. They're working their way back up to the front door. Well, I got a chance to go watch people. I'm excited about that this year. I'm going to go watch some games. Hey, you got the Lone Star sports show all things sports we are all the way down into the red zone we don't have any more two minute warnings we don't have anything else left we get ready to push it down get ready for hump day tomorrow get ready to do your thing we got staff meetings around here to get in we're gonna break away real real fast and get this five minute piece in in preparation for what we the direction we're going go get your stuff done so we can come back and all things sports all things texas continues to be the way we make it do what it does. Lone Star Sports Show right on the Lone Star Sports Network. See you on Thursday, Basketball Thursday. We talk more about what's going to be going on with all the camps, with the the, with the uh, Scout Focus Camp that will be going on, the academic camp that will be going on over at Duncanville High School, and what we'll be doing. <laughs> what we'll be doing over. Lord, I'm sorry. O- o- over. No, that was me. <laughs> you have to do Steve Urkel on that. Did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be back. Go get your hump day in. We got to get going. Oh, uh, Coach trying to get out here early and, and duck out on us. No, no, we'll, we'll be back in just a little bit. Ne- and after you get through these next 48 hours, we'll see you right back here on the Lone Star Sports Show.